regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education, but also uh, by the parents of a special meeting. Uh, so thank you for everybody who's here. Uh, I'd ask everybody to turn off their cell phones so it doesn't interfere with our microphone uh, during the meeting. And as you're doing, if you please join me and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. And um, at this stage, I'd ask the secretary to call the roll. Gladly. President Wasserman? Here. Vice President Baker is absent. Secretary Kaminsky, myself, is here. Treasurer Brandstant? Here. Member Gordon? Here. Member McFarland? Here. And Member Vanderkellen is absent. Thank you. We do I have a quorum. Sense. With that, um, you will notice our agenda is slightly different tonight. We normally start with our consent agenda, but due to the volume of guests we have, that I have a suspicion I want to speak to the board. Um, we will we change the agenda, Carl, on you to do uh, comments from the public first. But before we begin that, I would like um, um, the Ellingers to step forward, please. And Carl and your wife and your daughter. <laughs> uh, out front. Forward, out front. <laughs> on camera ring. First thing, Gail, I'd like to present this to you to pin on your husband because I'm terrible at it and you'll know how to do it. <laughs> okay, that will work. And Gail, that's for everything you've put up with with the last six years with all of us. And Kate, for all you've done in moving from your own hometown to come to Midland to join your father's okay. trip. So thank you very, very much. And I uh, just want you to know from here on, we're going to be honoring Carl. Okay. <laughs> so the TV audience knows um, Mr. Ellinger has insisted that we as a board do no dinners, no receptions, uh, no public acclamation, but most of the board members, and I agree, decided that was unacceptable. <laughs> and as a consequence, there are several people I don't want to speak. And uh, I know one of them for sure wants to speak, and I'd ask John Lynch, our city manager, to come forward. Thank you, School Board President Wasserman and honorable members of the board appreciate the opportunity to address you this evening and to address Mr. Ellinger. My name is John Lynch and I have four children who are um, students in the Midland Public School System. I'm the city manager for the city of Midland and so in both of those capacities I've had a good number of occasions to cross paths with uh, Mr. Ellinger. And typically a Monday night I would be seated next to the mayor at a city council meeting which is unfolding as we speak. Uh, but this is a pretty historic occasion. And I felt strongly that I should be here to offer some remarks of both congratulations and thanks to Mr. Ellinger. I want to thank Mr. Ellinger first and foremost for doing something that I couldn't accomplish in 18 years. He was able to convince my children that I have a pretty cool job. And <laughs> he did it with one telephone call. And, and I'm gonna come back to that here in a moment. Uh, more significantly, however, I wanna thank Mr. Ellinger for being a public servant who is not just a purveyor of authority, but is a practitioner of leadership. In the fishbowl that we have the honor and privilege to work in, it's very easy to become a purveyor of authority. Authority is conferred upon individuals for the purpose of providing a service. And individuals with authority are simply judged on their effectiveness in marshalling that authority to produce the service. So to identify one who levies authority, you ask a who question. Who has the authority to accomplish X, for example? However, practitioners of leadership stand a taller test. They're not subject to the who question, they're subject to the what question, because leadership is experiential. You have to do things to demonstrate leadership, to exercise it. And because it's experiential, 
it places several demands on the individual who is engaged in leadership. Demands such as having clarity of purpose, reverence for the pains of change, and a commitment to the notion at all times that you could be wrong and being subject to constantly evaluating where you're going and monitoring the progress that you're making. So in Mr. Ellinger, we look for signs of leadership being demonstrated. Those signs include things like making the people around you better, developing their own leadership skills, creating an environment in which solutions to problems can be discovered, and when confronting difficult choices selecting choices and disturbing people at a rate at which they can absorb them. So when you meet resistance, you can be pretty well assured that you're demonstrating leadership. So most significantly, I want to thank you, Carl, for being a public official and working in the fishbowl in a way that demonstrates leadership versus taking the easy route and just being a purveyor of authority. And then coming back to this issue of making my job sound cool, Never before were my children so interested in what I actually do for a living is the cold winter evening that I got a call from the school superintendent for an update on the status of the city's plow teams so he could make an informed decision as to whether or not there would be school the following day. <laughs> Suddenly, when you become the second person in the world to know whether or not Midland Public Schools is going to have school the next day, your job is pretty darn cool. <laughs> so I appreciate that as well. In all seriousness, Carl, it's been an honor and a privilege to work with you. I thank you for all that you've done, and I wish you and your family fulfillment and success in everything that you do. And not to be rude, I thank you for the opportunity to speak first. I do have another meeting to get off to, and so I'm going to slip out. Thank you so Thank much. you, John, for your comment. Thank you, John. No, uh, Bert, little Bertie's also told me that uh, Don Sheets would like to speak tonight. He's uh, Executive Vice President and CFO of Dow Corning. Thank you very much to the board for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Carl, as I look at you sitting there, I'm sorely tempted to give you feedback on the budget. Um, I haven't quite had this position before, uh, but we'll pass on that for tonight. And. Uh, I'm here really representing myself as a parent. My wife, Angela, and I have two kids that were spent their entire uh, public school career in the Midland Public Schools, and also uh, probably more significantly to the event here tonight, Dow Corning Corporation, one of the major employers in our community, and, uh, and a, a corporation that has been blessed to benefit from all of the benefits um, that Midland Public Schools gives the, the sons and daughters of our employees. And it still remains one of the great attractants to people who come to our community. We constantly showcase Midland Public Schools. And even though there have been difficult times and difficult uh, issues that have come along the way, it is still a competitive advantage for this community to offer the type of public education that we, that we enjoy in this town and is due no, in no small part to your labors over your career here. So on behalf of Dow Corning, its employees, uh, on behalf of Angela and myself, we wish you the best uh, in retirement, and we thank you for your leadership. John said it really well. That's a tough act to follow. But I would simply add, and for your personal courage in taking on issues that uh, needed to be taken on, needed to be dealt with, and needed to be resolved. And uh, for that, we're very grateful. So thank you. God bless, and uh, congratulations. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Don, Don is too modest to say this, but <clears throat> we have uh, a number of you that are in this room that join us from time to time throughout each year as our representatives of the community leaders, and Don is one of those, and he, w we can always count on Don at those meetings to ask a question about the budget, so <laughs> that's what he was alluding to. <laughs> and with that, that same little bird landed on my other shoulder and told me uh, Mr. Ellen Ott would like to speak tonight. Ellen is formerly with Chemical Bank and is currently Vice President Treasurer of the Gerstecher Foundation. Thank you, Jerry, for the opportunity to pay tribute to our friend and leader, Carl Hellinger. Carl, congratulations on your retirement. Your leaving is a big loss to the Midland Public Schools. I have enjoyed the relationship we have had during the past six years. While seeing you and while serving on numerous community boards together, and working with the Gerstacker Foundation. I've had the opportunity to observe your patience, understanding, and incredible ability to grasp situations clearly. 
You always handle yourself with dignity and courtesy. Your practice of sound decision making, professionalism, and uncompromising business ethics are truly a legacy worth truly. I wish you and your family the best in coming years. Thanks so much. And uh, Mr. Dave Dunn, would you like to say a few words? For our audience, Dave is the President and CEO of Wolverine Bank. Uh, whoops. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Carl. And, um, and also, I'd like to take a moment and thank our entire uh, school board uh, present and past for all of your leadership that you've provided over the years for one of our community's most important assets, our, our students and their education. Uh, <coughs> Carl, as far as singling you out, I just want to let you know that my expectations of you were very high before I even met you. Uh, first of all, because of Midland uh, Public Schools and their high expectations and high standards for excellence. And then from a more personal standpoint, I've actually had the opportunity to know some people for a few decades before I'd even met you and your family. And they were from your, uh, your prior community. As a matter of fact, uh, the folks that I got to know very well and I've known for about three decades uh, were a uh, business uh, owner in your former hometown, a uh, bank CEO, and then also one of your employees. And that was one of your employees when you were a principal of the uh, junior high school, as well as the school superintendent. And while all of them spoke uh, very highly of your character and your leadership, it was really what stood out from uh, the teacher that made the biggest impact on me, and quite frankly, elevated the expectations of what you would do for middle public schools. And what that teacher uh, stated a number of years ago was that no matter what the situation, you always looked out for the students and the teachers, and you always did what was best for them. So you put all those characteristics together, and it, it makes for very high expectations. Um, and one of the things to move forward, um, I've had the opportunity to witness your leadership, uh, certainly with Midland Public Schools, but in the community. And uh, we've served on the board of directors together for Midland Tomorrow. And I've certainly seen you in numerous other community organizations and a lot of activities where we've worked together. And I think to go through with my personal observations, the spirit in which you operate, where you, um, you're always very friendly, you listen to people, you encourage people, uh, is just incredible, where you bring out the best in all those around you, and then you, in a very respectful way, uh, are very, uh, very uh, impactful on how you deliver your leadership. And one of the people that I had talked with, I mentioned we'd be talking this evening, is Scott Walker, president of Midland Tomorrow. And as you might uh, appreciate, and I'm going to quote some of Scott's comments, is that over the course of Carl's term, he helped enable our success with his thoughtful and careful perspective creativity, and leadership that significantly contributed in shaping our strategies and our activities. Carl has always been well prepared for meetings and often poses enlightening questions that challenge staff with a line of reasoning to develop our strategies or provide us the opportunity to clarify the matters for the board. It's been a distinct pleasure to have Carl on our executive board, as well as partnering with him at Midland Public Schools. He is a true Midland champion that advocates the fostering of economic growth and prosperity for all of our community. A very uh, insightful words by, uh, by Scott and very appreciative. And Carl, I just wanna say that I'm very grateful uh, for all that you have done in providing leadership uh, to Midland Public Schools during some especially challenging times and everything that you've done for our community. So on, on behalf of our students, our school, 
in our community. I know exactly what that former teacher was talking about who um, happened to have taught your daughter at one point, and I believe it was fourth or fifth grade. Uh, and that put her in a very unique situation, teaching the school superintendent's kid, if you will, <laughs> and just tremendous respect. But I now understand and I know that you really are always looking out for the students, for the school, and for the community. And uh, very grateful. Wish you all the best. Thank Thanks you. so much, sir. Thank you. Our, um, our next speaker uh, will soon be joining Carl in retirement. And at this point, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Sid Allen come forward. I believe Sid is still the current president and CEO of the Midland Area Chamber of Commerce, but soon to be retired. <laughs> Always following Carl's footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of uh, Carl Ellinger. During Carl's time as superintendent at Midland Public Schools, the business community through the Midland Area Chamber of Commerce and the school district have worked on many programs collaboratively. I believe we have an extremely strong relationship and much, much of that is due to Carl's leadership. His knowledge of business as a previous businessman has helped immensely to bridge whatever gap there may have been between business and publication, uh, public education locally in the past. Carl has served this district and the community with integrity, common sense, and professionalism. I can't think of many people who, have been, who would have been effective as Carl has been during particularly challenging times in public education. I have a great deal of respect for the manner in which he has handled various obstacles that he had no hand in creating, but simply went about the task of finding solutions. Personally, I sort of like Carl. He and I have had many discussions about kids as his daughter and my son are the same age. He's always provided me with valuable insight on personal and professional matters. Carl will be missed in our organization and I personally wish you the best in your future endeavors and I hope you have a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks Thank you, Sid. Our next speaker was going to be Chris Toynton. Um, the President and CEO of the Greater Midland Community Centers, but Chris called in at the last minute. He is very sick tonight, and he definitely wants us to extend his uh, your, his best wishes in your retirement, Carl. So, on behalf of Chris, from here um, we have a, a, a trio of uh, former board members that would like to speak. And uh, first person I would call up is Dr. Dick Dolinsky, former board member and president. Thank you, Jerry, <coughs> board members, Carl. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I wouldn't miss it for the world. <laughs> when, uh, when I retired from the Legacy Center for Community Success uh, a year and a half ago, I referenced the signature song from the musical Rent. That song is called Seasons of Love. You may recall the lyrics. They say 525,600 minutes, 525,000 moments so dear, 525,600 minutes, how do you measure, measure a year? In daylights, in sunsets, in midnights, in cups of coffee, in laughter, in strife. And then there's a pause and they say, but how about love? How about love? I was reflecting that these same considerations apply to you, Carl. During your tenure as our superintendent, in six years by my reckoning, you've experienced over three million moments, most of them dear, but I suspect, as other speakers have said, some of them not so dear such as some very difficult decisions, school closings, difficult contract negotiations, persistent budget challenges. And oh yeah, let's not forget, as John Lynch said, <coughs> deciding about snow days, uh, interminable meetings with staff and public, and always, always loads of other issues, both big and small. However, despite whatever speed bumps and potholes there are, of course, there was a preponderance of pluses, achievements in your six seasons of love here with Midland Public Schools. There are too many accomplishments to cite specifically, but since Midland Public Schools is principally about getting it right for kids, student achievement would be the top metric on my list. Midland Public Schools is demonstrably one of the top performing school districts in the state, if not in the country, as measured by standard objective evaluations of student outcomes. 
tools that, such as the MEEP scores, ACT performance outcomes, graduation rates, post-secondary enrollment, and, and others. In fact, just last week at a College Access Network meeting, I learned that Midland County is the fourth highest performing area in the state of Michigan for post-secondary enrollments behind only three other counties, each of which is highly advantaged with a major university there, namely Washtenaw, Oakland, and Ingham counties. In addition to your outstanding leadership of Midland Public Schools, you've been very actively engaged in the community as well. I'm personally very pleased with and honored for your service to the board of the Legacy Center for Community Success. In this role, you've been a very passionate advocate for our programs, our education-related initiatives, including literacy, early childhood development, and developmental assets. My other regular contact with Carl is at Rotary, where you've been an engaged member, again, ardently supporting Rotary's education projects and policies. Carl, for all of these and the other gifts you've selflessly bestowed on our community, I want to commend you and offer my genuine appreciation. Without your leadership, Midland would be a much poorer place, and our children would not have been as blessed with the educational oasis that you've helped provide for them. From a grateful community, then, I thank you for all of your contributions, for the successes that you've had, and for the well-being of our children. So as you transition into retirement, my closing wish for you comes from my Polish heritage, <laughs> Stolat, that translates to be, may you live to be 100 years old. By my estimates, that's about 22 million more moments. <laughs> my wish is that they may all indeed be moments that are very dear, blessing you and your family, friends, with health, happiness, and above all, many, many, many more seasons of love. All the best, my friend, and may God bless you. unique data-driven way you uh, <laughs> you make me you make me proud to be associated with you and I mean that sincerely <laughs> thank you dr. Delinsky um, at this stage I'd like uh, another former president of the board to come forward uh, mr. Rick Ole good evening I feel like I've kind of graduated now being associated with a trio of former board members. <laughs> <right here. laughs> so. <laughs> Not quite as old as you, but close. I figured this must be 22 years since I kind of addressed the board from this vantage point, so uh, good looking group up here. I, I'm really glad you invited me here. Um, it's really kind of a, a special time for me, and I'm, I'm really, really happy that um, Gail and Kate are here, because I think while this is all about Carl here tonight, we realize it's all three of them that made the investment in this community and have made the investment in middle public schools. So. Thank you for all of your investment, and I'm happy that you're here tonight to hear firsthand the regard in which Carl's held by all aspects of the community. Anyways, I'm here obviously as a former board member, having retired from the board this past December after 20 years of service. I'm also the parent of four graduates of Midland Public Schools and served as an active MPS parent for, for about 25 years. And I was privileged, as other people in this room, to have served with three outstanding superintendents during my tenure on the board. Art Frock, Gary Hughes, and of course for the past six years, Carl. The most important decision we all know we ever make as a board is the selection of the superintendent. And the decision I'm most proud of in my last six years, obviously, was being part of the decision to bring Carl to Midland Public Schools. And we know that while the board is the official elected governing body of the district and provides leadership, make no mistake on where the real professional leadership comes from, and it comes from the superintendent and his executive leadership team. And just like the previous superintendents, Carl has had the exact right skills and leadership abilities that we needed to face the challenges during these past six years. And I think Carl has navigated us through the roughest seas I experienced in my 20 years on the board. At my final board meeting in December, this is what I said to Carl at the time in thanking him. I said, Carl, you work long hours. You are sensitive but emotionally tough. You balance educational needs with financial realities. You carry the challenge of leading a large district in a community with extremely high expectations and continued a long track record of excellence. And you are passionate about what you do. And here's a few additional points I would like to make tonight and why I think we owe Carl and his family a tremendous debt of gratitude 
and how appreciative and grateful and fortunate we have been to have his leadership for the last six years. Number one, a superintendent's job is one of the most challenging public roles any executive or experienced leader can take on. Always subject to public scrutiny, criticism, second guessing, and by a multitude of stakeholders and constituents with a variety of different vantage points. The superintendent can't change the cards we are dealt, just how we play the hand. Carl, you stood tall in difficult decisions, handled the different perspectives with grace, respect, and professionalism. You always guided us in how to best play the hand we were dealt. Number two, Carl, you have consistently supported and encouraged your excellent team of leaders around you. You developed a great team, you empowered them, you advocated for them, and you created a culture of teamwork and collaboration. You've also advocated for all Midland Public School staff and always reminded us of the key contributions every single person makes to the success of our students. Your spirit of collaboration, teamwork, and transparency carried into the community as well. Three, Carl, you've always placed our students as the sole reason all of us work or volunteer here. Your decisions were always student-centered and student-driven. Four, Carl, you always led with the long-term in mind. The success of Midland Public Schools is dependent on the decisions superintendents and boards make that outlast any individual. Carl, future boards and future superintendents will thank you for the leadership you provided in this challenging period of time. Effective leaders leave footprints for others, deep footprints that make it easier for people to follow and don't easily get washed away once you have left. And Carl, your footprints will be lasting. And lastly, lastly maybe a little bit of my healthcare background. When part of our body, be it an organ or a limb, is in disrepair, we rely on the heart to keep pumping life into us. And just like with organizations like Midland Public Schools, the heart is always engaged and provides life to the organizational body that may need some fixing or healing. Effective leaders manage with their head, but they lead with their heart. And Carl, your heart was always engaged, no matter how hard the decisions were that we were all faced with. So Carl, thank you for your vision, your wisdom, your dedication, your teamwork, the footprints you have left us, and for always leading with your heart. It was my privilege to work alongside of you. Thank you. With that, the third of the trio would come forward, uh, Ken Malt, former president of the Public Schools Board of Education. You know, I thought I would probably end up following Ole, so I, I limited my remarks and actually uh, wrote them down this evening, which is unprecedented for me. Um, it, it, if anybody knows me, Carl knows me, and it's uh, generally it's shoot from the hip and speak my mind, and so we'll do that this evening. But before we talk about Carl's accolades with respect to this district and what I, how I feel about those, I want to <coughs> talk about Carl's, our relationship and what we've, the trust that we've built. You know, uh, being board president, as many of my predecessors have been in that position, and, and Jerry's been there a couple of times, um, it's a difficult role, uh, but not as difficult as it would be if we didn't have a superintendent uh, like Carl in the place at the time that, in, that was critically needed uh, for middle public schools. And our relationships was one of trust, integrity, open communications, and sometimes more communications than can re care to uh, remember, but uh, it was all good. And uh, uh, coming from a, a, a law enforcement background, communications to me was, was paramount with respect to our success as leaders of this district, uh, both from the board's perspective and Carl's superintendent. I can tell you that this man provided the information in a timely manner, and our relationship was built on his, our trust and the success of that let made major decisions that led this district forward at a time that was unprecedented with respect to what was going on in public education in the state of Michigan. If anybody th thinks that Carl didn't have sleepless nights and that we could just go home at night and shut the lights off and everything was fine, um, you were 
looking or through a different glass than I presently was, and I'm sure Carl would, would have been. He had many sleepless nights, and we had long conversations, both in person and on the phone, on a constant basis, whether it be closing five buildings or, teaching, or dealing with the uh, a contract or a, another major issue in, in the district. It didn't matter. He was always there and always very influential in helping me understand what was going on in this district. Don't let anybody fool you that if, as, as a board member, that if you come to this board and you think you have the answers and you have a clear understanding as to what public education is about without true leadership at the helm, uh, you really don't have that understanding until maybe about the eighth year you really get a glimpse of, of what that might look like. But with Carl's guidance uh, and his wisdom, his integrity, and making those, t helping me make those tough decisions and leading this board, uh, I was honored to say that he was my friend, foremost and, and, and first. And uh, coming from the streets, and, and I'll qualify that, that comment by saying that uh, being former law enforcement, um, that means a lot. And it means a lot to me. And I'll tell you straight up, Carl, I have your six. I will always have your six. And so now that we've spoken about, or I've spoken about your relationship, I'll talk about this district and what this meant to me. Because I'm one of four, few board members that ever sat on that board that was from Midland Public Schools. And to think that as a, back in 19 something, I was <laughs> a, a graduate of Midland Public Schools. And to think that at some point in my future, I would sit at that board t table and have the, uh, that designation of being pre board president um, was quite overwhelming. But, but through your leadership, I had every confidence that my experience in middle public schools, my wife's experience in middle public schools, my daughter's experience in middle public schools would be equal to anything that came in our past and will be in our future. And I'm very proud to say that I, uh, you know, we talked about this in a recent discussion uh, to find your predecessor and the, the comment was made that our superintendents have been in perfectly timed for middle and public schools and that every superintendent we've had has been right for this district at the moment they've been here. So with that, Carl, I thank you. I thank your family and, and all their sacrifices they've made when we've had meetings till 1130 midnight and beyond. So again, thank you. Thank you for your friendship and uh, God bless you. I believe uh, Ms. Barb Jocks would like to come up and speak. Barb is a teacher in the public school. Thank you so much, Jerry, for asking me to come and speak. I'm so honored to do this. Thank you. You are genuine. You are kind. You are good. I am thankful for you. I am thankful for your support your honest and sincere approach to your work and to your colleagues, your steady focus on finding the best possible ways to do things, your dedication in working as a team member, and your positive spirit and energy. I asked for your guidance and support upon your arrival to Midland Public Schools. You invited me immediately for a conversation. From the original idea of a youth community choir to Milestones, Franklin Center, Midland County Foster and Adoption Network, and now West Midland Family Center. You have helped me on a very meaningful pursuit. You have helped me. Beginning from that very first day, you have been instrumental in helping me find ways to bring music to children who might not otherwise receive a music experience. We have had wonderful conversations about education, what children need, and how to offer them the very best possible educational experience. You are dedicated to the whole child. I have always loved the beginning moment of the school year. I've always celebrated MPS and am so proud of our school district. It is exciting to feel the strength of our team on that very first day. Our first meeting is full of promise and possibility as we embark on a new year. Each year, you bring something very positive to share with the teaching staff. One year, you brought a wonderful short film documentary on the Seattle Fish Company. 
Their spirit was so like mine that I remember thinking, I wish I could meet them. Those people would be my friends. As time went by, I wanted to watch the video again, but I wasn't able to find it anywhere. I asked if you might still have access to the film. You looked for it and couldn't find it either. One day, I received a gift in the interdepartmental mail from you. You sent me your own book, Fish, describing the Seattle Fish Company philosophy from your personal collection. You remembered, the philosophy is a workplace where everyone chooses to bring energy, passion, and a positive attitude to the job every day. It celebrates an environment where people are truly connected to their work, to their colleagues, and to their customers. You have steadily shown support and interest in our students. You have visited my music classrooms and concerts on numerous occasions. You celebrate our students in all of their passions. You celebrate our students for who they are and what they do. You cheer them on. I am thankful for these things you do, and I am aware that you do these things because you are a good person. It's natural. I decided to look up the word superintendent. I wanted to find out what the word means and why it is given to this particular position. This brought four words. Super, very good or pleasant, excellent, of high grade or quality, exhibiting the characteristics of its type to an extreme or excessive degree. Intend, have a course of action as one's purpose or objective, a plan, to direct the mind on, to proceed on a course, to design for a specified use or future. Superintendent, one who has executive oversight and charge. Charge, a person or thing committed to the care of another. Superintendent is a word made up of a character statement, an action word, and a mission. It's a good word for what you do. It's a good word for you. Your time with MPS has been filled with challenging moments. Through each challenge, you have taken part as a member of the team. Leadership is participation. Leadership is caring for the decisions, knowing the decisions are people and lives and future impact. Leadership isn't easy. It is a brave thing to do. It is working from a human perspective to gather the best ideas for, hum for forward movement. The best leaders are those who look at all perspectives, focus on finding a way, involve the people who will put the vision into practice, and actively take part in the forward movement with heart and kindness. I know you to be a person of character. I know you to be a leader. You have conducted yourself with genuine commitment, best wisdom, and care. We are fortunate to have had you as our superintendent. We are all called to find a way to give, using our smartest mind and utilizing our unique talents. By purpose or by chance, we are here together at this particular time. This school system is shared by history, present, and future. The schools belong to the children. We are so fortunate to share their lives with them. We are so fortunate to be the ones who bring them an education. This is our turn. This is our moment to give our smartest, our best, our most caring and loving gifts. I think of life as a relay shared by those before us, to us, and to those who will continue after our turn. This opportunity is our gift and responsibility. You have been a fine superintendent. You have had a tremendous impact on me. You have been a mentor to me. You are also a kindred spirit. We are friends. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barb. And last uh, tonight that I know is going to speak is uh, Mr. Paul White.
I know that you haven't used the timer for anyone so far, but <laughs> when I was walking up, it, yeah. <laughs> I'm used to it. But, you know, Carl told me, hey, Paul, when you start going, you kind of get off task a little. You know, you may want to take notes and write them down on a piece of paper. Look, I'm trainable. <laughs> you know, I could clear this room if I attempted to sing the song To Sir With Love that Lulu sang all those years back. Many young people may not remember that, but when I was a kid, that was a popular song. And the words, and, and I won't sing because Mrs. Jackson stopped me <laughs> halfway through and come up and say, start over again. Well, how can I thank someone who has taken me from crayons, she says, to perfume, I'd say cologne. It isn't easy, but I'll try. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to say thanks. And one of the things that I find amazing with you, Carl, at first I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, a few years ago when you and I would meet, I would think it was always about the kids. And I came to realize as we became closer friends and we talked about more things, it was all about the community. See, you would take things we'd be talking about, for example, capital expenditures, and we'd be discussing it and you'd be saying, you know, it's a lot of money, but we need to spend it. Here's why. And you would talk about how that expenditure would filter through to benefit the community. We talked about the teachers, and one of the things I always remembered was how um, you realized that the teachers that we have here at Midland Public Schools were such a great gift. They were so smart, and they were so good at doing what they do and you realize that and you wanted to take that and maximize that and get the most out of that i was so impressed with that and you'd always talk about how that would benefit the community athletics we spent a long time talking about athletics you know i love athletics my kids are involved in athletics we talk about not just okay we have athletics but how do athletics play a role in the development of our kids and how does that affect our community? That would be our discussion. I love that. We talk about test scores. Oh, I know we've got to comply with those test scores and yeah, we've got to meet these certain requirements and everything. But in doing that, how can we still maintain the quality of education that we want to give these kids, the foundational building blocks that will allow them to go out and pursue their dreams. And how's that going to affect them pursuing their dreams, this community? Love that about you. Special education. Had a few talks about that, didn't we? <laughs> you would sit there and you would talk about it and say, you know, we've got a good system. How can we maximize it so that it benefits each and every student? Not just the student with special needs, all students and then the greater community, and big picture wise, our entire society. That is so cool. I love that about you. You talk about additional staff, you know, you never left out people like the receptionists, the parapros, the coaches, all the additional people that were part of Midland Public Schools. Talk about them too and the role they played in the bigger picture, and how that bigger picture affected our community. Love that about you. Curriculum, we discussed that. Technology, we'd have discussions about that. And it was always like, man, you know, and this, this recent defeat of technology, that was tough on you, it was tough on me too. I feel like I, you know, didn't do as much as I should have. It doesn't mean I've given up, just means it's delayed because, man, we talked about dreams of what that could do, and those dreams aren't going to go away. We're going to keep pursuing them. But we'd always talk about what that would do for the kids, and then when you'd bring it all the way around, what it would do for this community. That was always what it was always about. And oh, yeah, the kids. You know, one of the great things you did, you helped me to move from thinking about what was best for my kids 
to this place that all of us should be at, what's best for all kids? See, and that was a big transition. When I moved away from what's best for my kids to what's best for all kids, and I took action, I saw some great results. Me bringing a speaker in from California to have a, uh, an assembly at Northeast Middle School had a positive impact. Did my kids benefit? Yeah. So did 850 other kids. And so did the staff. And so did our community. See, you helped me make that happen. You taught me that. How can I benefit all kids, which then benefits the community? So I really thank you for that. You know, I'm a product of Midland Public Schools. I went to Seabird, I went to Jefferson, I went to Dow High School, and I'm very proud of that. I am. I live in this community with a lot of pride that I went to Midland Public Schools, and my kids go to Plymouth, Northeast, and Midland High. I'm pretty well-rounded here <laughs> at Midland Public Schools, and I love this school system, and I love every single person who's associated with it because, you know, my four kids who attend these schools, um, I think they're attending, I want to say the best public school in the world. People would say, ah, Paul, that's pushing it. So I'm going to tell you it's the best public school in my world. My world's a pretty good world. And I'm proud of that fact. I am so very grateful that my kids are here. When people talk about you, and if they were asked, is his cup half full or half empty? I think everyone would say half full, but I say your cup's always been overflowing. And because it's been overflowing, you've always said, who can I share this with? You've always been about others, never yourself. And I know I've spent a lot of time with you. Which, by the way, um, question for you. You ready for this one? Kind of like a test. This is so great. <laughs> when is an apple tree successful? I'll help you out a little, because you're not being uh, graded on this. <laughs> Most people would say an apple tree is successful when it produces apples. My answer is a little different. I think an apple tree is successful when it produces additional apple trees. And so I'm really grateful that you and your family are sticking around this community, because I want you to watch those other apple trees grow. My four kids are going to be some of them, and there's thousands of others. So I'm going to do my part in, one, helping you and your family stay around here a really long time so you can see that, and two, I'm going to take advantage of all this free time you're going to have <laughs> for you and I to get together and keep doing things that benefit this community. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Is there anybody else in the audience want to comment on this part of, of what people have been speaking of? If not, Carl, I, I would like to let you know that uh, there were several people that really wanted to be here, but they're out of town. Doug Fillmore, John Blahanka in particular, and, and Mike Hayes got tied up tonight. But in addition, I have some uh, letters from some folks I'd like to read. <laughs> Just a quick, uh, quick few. Dear Jerry, on the occasion of the public tribute offered to Superintendent Carl Ellinger at the board meeting on June, June 24th, I express my gratitude for Carl's effective and dedicated service to our community. His leadership has allowed intentional growth. He has guided significant transitions. He has encouraged vision for the future. He has been, a, he has been generous in his commitment of time and energy. I commend the board for its support and encouragement of Carl's leadership. I believe we shall continue to affirm the impact of his direction as new seasons for public education unfold. While we shall miss his collegial spirit in many community endeavors, we shall hold to his friendship and his hope for enhancements in the field of education throughout the service area of Midland Public Schools. Sincerely, Wally Maiden. Uh, a few brief comments on this one. I'll, I'll cut this one a little short. Dear Carl. Congratulations on the occasion of your retirement. It has been a distinct pleasure working with you on your tireless efforts to maintain and improve the high standards for K-12 education in Midland. And you, for that, deserve the greatest respect. Best wishes and continued success, Randy Rager. And last.
lastly, on behalf of the employees and local management of the Dow Chemical Company, we extend our thanks and appreciation to Carl Ellinger for his outstanding service to our community in general and to the Midland Public Schools in particular. Since his arrival in Midland, Carl has been very proactive in his community engagement. He was active participating in new, participation in New Rotary Club, board membership at MyTech Plus, as an executive committee member of Midland Tomorrow Board of Directors, Carl's demonstrated his commitment to the social, economic, and educational well-being of our Midland community. We've had the privilege of regular meetings with Carl to exchange ideas and to better understand the opportunities, needs, and challenges of our students' education. His support of and advocacy for the International Baccalaureate Program at Dow and Midland High Schools is but one of many examples of the positive outcomes stemming from our constructive dialogue with Carl. Carl has made a positive and sustaining impact on Midland Public Schools, and for that, we are very grateful. We also congratulate Carl on his retirement and extend our best wishes for his future endeavors and undertakings. He has and continues to be a valued partner in the success of the Midland community. Sincerely, Bo Miller. So, so Carl, um, that's the end of the, somewhat of the end of the surprise tonight. Um, we typically don't let people rebut people who come to the table so we don't get an endless dialogue. And at the end of the board meeting tonight, when we go to board comments, the board will address this issue and give you the last word. But if there's any comment you'd like to make now, we will suspend our normal rules to let you comment. Yeah, thanks mm -hmm. for giving me that opportunity, Jerry. First of all, um, I want to apologize to our teachers and others that might be here for their presentation for a student project because I wanted my last board meeting really to reflect what I thought was one of the neatest projects for students in my six years of being here. I didn't know you were going to have to wait for an hour. <laughs> I didn't know that any of these people were going to be here or, or I wouldn't be the only one without a suit coat and a tie-in. <laughs> so, uh, Dick, uh, thank you for doing that. Typically in the summer we dress down for meetings and now I understand my, why Mr. Wasserman kept me in my office until five minutes before the board meeting started. It, um, I don't even know how to say anything except for thank you. It, um, I think when I came to this district, um, well, let me start out with this. The uh, current search consultant that helped the board find uh, my successor explained to Jerry that the average stay for a superintendent in the country right now, believe it or not, is um, 2.7 years. I think that speaks to how enormously challenging these jobs really are. I mean, who would change their employer every three years by choice? I mean, that, that, that speaks to the challenge, I think, that all educators face in, in how people look at public education in the country right now. I worry about that in the future. But one of the things I did not understand about this community, and I don't really know how anyone could when you come here, is to know how enormously complex it is, not just for the superintendent or the executive leadership team or the leadership of our teachers and the different employee groups, but you're fitting into a system that is much larger than in smaller districts is defined as a K through 12 system. There's a whole complexity of how you work together as a community and how good things happen here, how you communicate about that, how you have to serve on community committees to make those networks effective, like Paul said, for the community, not just in my advocacy for Midland Public Schools. And that takes an enormous amount of time and it takes a lot of behind the scenes effort to make what happens here twice a month look as seamless as I sometimes think the board gets accused of being when you have 7-0 votes and so on. There is a lot of preparation that goes into that. I couldn't be the face of that without the effective support of all these people sitting right here, Dr. Ellison and Gary Verlindi and Linda Klein and Cindy Young. She's like another administrator here. And that group used to be much larger than this um, a few years before I joined the district. So that just meant there was more work with less people to do it. And that's true for all the employees in public schools now, just given what's happened with budgeting in recent years. But I couldn't be in a position to facilitate what small part of that I do if it hadn't been for my wife, Gail Nonemaker. <coughs> and my daughter. <laughs> A number of you alluded to the support that it takes for your family in order to accomplish everything that I just described as a superintendent. And you don't, do, you don't accomplish anything by yourself as a superintendent. We've gone through some really difficult times. 
I remember Bill Monroe, the band teacher at Midland High School, saying to me not too long ago, you know, Carl, I'm not really sure that we ever saw the best you had to offer because we were mired in some really um, challenging situations here, financially, employee relations. We could not afford the operations that we had on our hands. And I'm proud for any small way that I've contributed to a solution to that, wh whether I led it or I facilitated it. It takes a whole group of people to have gotten us through the last six years, and a lot of that leadership is right here at this table and with former board members. Thank you, Ken and, and, and Dick and, and Rick for being here. You all have been mentors and guides in my professional career, all of you, in one way or another. Uh, in ways that you would never imagine, and I don't even know how to express appreciation for that. So it's really been a pleasure for me to serve in this role. The bottom line, I was pleased, David, I don't know who you talked to. I have to find out, you know, who my daughter's fourth or fifth grade teacher was. I remember <laughs> their names, and I know Katie does. But I've always had in my professional career the ability to connect with almost anybody. It just had to do with how I was raised. And, and I was raised to find goodness in everybody you run into. And find a way to connect. Don't be so arrogant that think you can't find a way to connect with everyone you meet in life. And I'm proud, I think, to have led my life um, by, by that guide, guidepost. And so my years here have been good. I thank all of you for being here. Um, I was overwhelmed when I walked in. I didn't know who to hug first. Thank goodness I remembered to hug my family first. <laughs> <laughs> and I just appreciate all the kind words. It's uh, very supportive, and it feels really good on the way out the door. Thank you so much. This means, Gail, that the board meeting is not going to be over by 8 or 8. <laughs> 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 and we certainly understand, those of you that came, please take this as an opportunity to leave. Um, the hockey team tonight, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard about that. Some Thank Chicago you, team. <laughs> Thank you to our guests. I really appreciate tonight's comments. Thank you very much. With that, uh, any other persons like to address the, um, address the board at this time? No, see none. Uh, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is our consent agenda. Um, consent agenda is the approval of our board meeting minutes from June 10th. Uh, bids received from custodial supply vendors uh, uh, to provide FX hard wound hand towels for our district facilities. The details are in the agenda. Bids were recently received for custodial supply vendors to provide some other equipment at, or supplies. That details are in the agenda. And bids are recently received for custodial supply vendors for other supplies, and those details are in the agenda, 3.2C. 3.2D is similar. 3.2E is approval to enter a 12-month uh, HVACR maintenance agreement with Jay Johnson of Midland for a boiler testing. And approval is requested under a 12-month compliance agreement with Vanguard Fire and Security to provide annual fire extinguisher, fire alarm, and wet sprinkler, dry sprinkler, and emergency lighting and testing inspections. Uh, there's a list of some retirement resignations and dates and approval of the school systems bills for the month of May and uh, some financial reports listing the purchase orders and listing the purchase card transactions. Uh, accept a motion for acceptance of the consent agenda. I will move to accept or adopt the consent agenda items 3.1 through 3.4 C as noted on the agenda. Moved by Member McFarland. Support. Support by Secretary Kaminsky. Uh, before we move into vote, any comment or changes or deletions or additions any board member would like to make? See none, we'll move into vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. We'll uh, move on to presentations of the board, and frankly, we're very eager to hear this. Um, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Central Middle School folks. <laughs> well, can I just introduce these two and, and 
This is Bernadette Wood um, on our right as we face her and uh, Sharon Dereese. They're both Central Middle School teachers. And I remember Mr. Verlindi passing an email on about this project that these folks have taken off on their own. They, they initiated it. It was all their idea. And I saw an opportunity to kind of broaden it out and reach out to some other community members and hopefully have this funded for another year. And we're very optimistic that that's going to happen. But when you look at all the pressure on public education right now and the importance to this country of science and math and STEM related type careers, this is something that focuses all that on girls, which I think is a tremendous project. And I'm going to turn it over to them because I'll murder it if I try to describe it. But Gary Verlindi has been very supportive of them. They reached out to him first. Um, he helped work with them a bit. But the people at Central deserve all the credit for it. And I think you're really going to enjoy this presentation that you hear tonight. Well, thank Go ahead, you very ladies. much. And uh, first, we'd like to congratulate uh, Carl Ellinger and Dr. Kathy Ellison on their retirement. And um, we hope all the best for you and want to thank you for your devotion to Central, or to not just Central's kids, <laughs> but to all of Midland's kids. So thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Bernadette Wood. I teach at Central Middle School. I've been teaching for 26 years total, 17 years at Central Middle School, and um, all of them with Sharon DeReese, my colleague. I've uh, always been fascinated by the interconnectedness between math and science and engineering. And that kind of led us to this project here, or led me to become involved with Sharon in this project, to kind of try to bring that excitement and passion that we both have in that, those STEM areas to um, our girls at Central Middle School. So I, I, I am Sharon Darius, and Bernadette has been an amazing colleague. Anytime that we want to try something, she's right there, whether there's a plan or not, we both jump in <laughs> which means we've stepped into other people's classrooms and team taught with the general education teacher. What that's meant for our careers and our background is that we have an incredibly broad base of, I guess, daily professional development in terms of learning the curriculum in science, math, social studies, language arts, across all grade levels. And we've both had the privilege of working with masterful, masterful teachers throughout the 17 and 18 years that we've both been at Central Middle School. So in terms of in education, it doesn't get any better than having that daily contact with all of these people. Um, as far as who we are and how the group got started, excuse me, um, we are a group of 7th grade and 10th and 11th grade high school girls. Bernadette and I have had, again, the privilege of working in these classrooms, and we get a chance to look at the kids who are struggling in an area, students who aren't struggling in an area. We get a chance to analyze what things are working, what things aren't working. And one thing that we've both noticed through the years is that some kids jump in to an activity, they jump into an assignment, and things just click while other kids struggle. When Gary Verlindi was our principal, he met with teachers regularly. And he expected us to be dealing with writing and reading in the content areas. And he expected things to be creative. But the other thing that Gary regularly encouraged us to do was to challenge the advanced students. And that really, really has stuck with us. And that challenge is difficult. How do you do all things for all students? So in looking at girls in science and in math, uh, students who are earning A's and B's, we both noticed that many of the girls did their homework every day. When you called on them in class, they knew the answer. They would answer, but they weren't volunteering. We get into a lab situation, and again, the girls knew what they were doing, they'd be elbowing their partner saying, no, no, do this, do this. No, we have to do this now. They were organized, they could mentor, they could help their partner fill out the lab work, but they weren't taking the lead. The boys, on the other hand, would take the lead. They'd jump in whether they knew what they were doing or not, and they knew what they were doing. Don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but what we wanted to do is figure out 
what's making these girls tick? Why are they taking the back seat when they could clearly become leaders? And at that point, we decided that we needed to do something for this subgroup. We knew that was our target group, but what would it be? What would it be that Bernadette and I could work on with this target group? And a couple of months ago, we came upon what this project would be. And what this is, is called the Raspberry Pi, and it is a $36 computer that has been designed by a company in England. They have a long kind of a story to them, but in a nutshell, they're a nonprofit company whose goal is to get computers in the hands of all children throughout the world. And they are being very successful in many developing nations in getting these computers in their hands. And we wanted them over here in the United States, of course. And um, so we brought it on board as a goal to teach computer programming to students. And um, it's an amazing little thing. It's only the size of a, um, I'm go back one. It's only the size of a credit card. I think we're passing it around right there. That's the whole computer. You only need maybe a television to use for a monitor, and any old keyboard usually will do. We've learned a lot about cords and peripherals since we've started with that, and that's not sometimes quite as straightforward as you would think, but um, we've learned a lot about that. Um, our hope was to also use these small computers, inexpensive computers, to run a multitude of experiments, to do projects, to get girls excited about technology, and to get them feeling confident that they can do this. And our main goal, of course, is the software, is to learn computer programming. But we have a sub-goal also that they need to be comfortable with the hardware. You need to know which plug goes where. You know, and that, that's, that's powerful in and of itself, which is what I've certainly learned, because I've finally mastered that. <laughs> um, so our, our main deal with this Raspberry Pi is to build interest in the kids and a knowledge base of how computers work, basically develop programming skills using Python. We've chosen Python because that is a Linux operating system. And Python is a very easy entry level computer programming language to learn on. And there's a lot of hobbyists out there that use it. And there's a lot of fun projects involved in, involved with um, writing programs using Python that we think will be good entry points for the girls. And um, the weather balloon idea, I think Sharon's gonna talk a little bit about how in the heck does this relate to a weather balloon. But um, we did send a weather balloon up recently, and we, our, our goal is to, to repeat this um, next year also and use our um, Raspberry Pi computer to develop some experiments and take some data. And um, so that it's nice and lightweight, which we found is very important with the weather balloon. <laughs> so we'll be, <laughs> that was a little trial and error, too. Uh, so that'll work for us very well, too. And... Um, the big goal is to get them a little bit more comfortable with technology and to then expose them to some career opportunities that they might have because they have these skills and they have this comfort level. We know that a really big thing with girls and why they don't go into computer programming or why they don't go into some of the hard sciences is because they don't see other people that look like them in those um, careers. And so we've done some research and have found um, uh, some organizations like She++ out at Harvard that are young women that started their own organization to start to show girls that, yes, you can do this, number one, and number two, look at, we look just like you look. You know, we're young, we're pretty, we're, you know, uh, vibrant, we're intelligent. You can do the hard sciences, too. It's an, it's an okay thing to do. And Sharon's going to talk a little bit about... Um, uh, how we're going to use this Raspberry Pi to facilitate our goals. <laughs> Here, take this out of my hands. <laughs> As you can see, the, the girls are very excited about having the small uh, computer in their hands and the colorful cases. So there's a lot of pluses with that. And we know in working with girls that that is very important, especially in the middle school age. And when they unpackaged this stuff and when they saw these things, it was all about, yes, this is very cute, this is adorable. And they were giggly and very excited about the possibilities of using the material. So shallow on our part? I think so. Let's <laughs> use this device to, to get them hooked in. As we brought these girls in, we asked their math and science teachers specifically, what students do you have 
girls specifically who have an ability in math, an interest in math, an ability and an interest in science, yet they are also independent and they question things. They want to know what's happening. So from that list, we pulled in 16 middle school girls and invited them to find out what's, what's this all about. We wanted them to be with other kids who were like them, with similar interests. We wanted them to solve real problems, and that's where the weather balloon comes in. We found that girls, middle school girls of this age, who are not interested in video gaming, who aren't interested in robots, they want something real. They want something that's connected with people, something that's connected with emotion. I know previously we heard a lot about heart with Mr. Ellinger, you know, leading with your head but really moving with your heart. And we know that that is one of the main differences in middle school between the girls and the boys. Um, we also worked with them during lunch hours and after school to help them identify some of their personal strengths. Not everyone is really strong at figuring out the sequential nature of coding. Not everyone, on the other hand, is really great with the hands-on uh, assembling these computers and dealing with the cords. So we wanted them to figure out what am I strong at right now, what can I add to the project, and where do I need to step back? Because a lot of times, part of what we can offer to a group is knowing when to step away. So we did work on that as well. Um, but first and foremost, and I know it's listed last on the list, we wanted students to have fun. And in getting to the fun, we showed them a video and we showed them a project of another seventh grade girl who worked on a science fair project and sent Hello Kitty up into space. And as part of her project, she took a weather balloon and with her father's help, added cameras and sent the little tiny Hello Kitty doll up to about 90,000 feet. <laughs> And they showed video of that. And when the girls saw that, they were out of their seats with excitement, laughing, giggling, um, wanted to send one up the next day. We also showed the video to some 10th and 11th grade physics students from Dow High. We wanted those three high school students to mentor our seventh grade girls and bring in those physics skills that the seventh graders didn't yet have. They had, at their age, the cool teenage age with the driver's license, <laughs> they had the exact same, uh, same reaction. They were giggling and laughing and all excited about, wow, we're gonna put together a weather balloon. But the problem came in, how do you do it? What does it look like and how are we going to make this happen? And that's where our principal, Steve Poole, stepped forward. We don't know why he did it, but he did it <laughs> and said, okay, we have some money. You can go ahead and buy five of these computers. Um, the administration tech center here was very gracious in getting us monitors that worked, uh, mouse and keyboard systems, and just providing that startup money to get things going. Of course, all of that took a little bit longer than we had hoped, but that's the nature of business. So we got into this project wanting to have the students write some very small programs just to collect data from the weather balloon, things like temperature, uh, altitude, barometric pressure. With the school year coming to a close, a lot of that got set aside in favor of this Hello Kitty project. But that's not a bad thing because you see the Hello Kitty project was the fun, authentic problem solving thing that really hooked the girls that made them come after school during lunch because they had this whole project of we're going to send something, we don't know what, but we're gonna send something up into space to honor Central Middle School. In my mind, and I think in Bernadette's mind, we were thinking maybe they'd send up some old pictures of when the school was built, maybe they'd send up class pictures, maybe they'd send up little notes, but no, they wanted to send up a squirrel. <laughs> right away, we want to send up a squirrel. And they wanted to go to a teacher's classroom and steal the squirrel skin or pelt or whatever it's called and send that up into space. So we worked with them. They sent out a little team after school, after people were gone. They broke into his room and stole the squirrel and left a ransom note and brought it back to the classroom and hid it. And that was all part of this process that really hooked them into then later 
doing the research for the altitude, doing the research for jet streams and wind patterns, doing the research for what's our tree cover and what's the probability that we may not get this payload back. This might end up 100 feet up in a tree. Or worse yet, this might end up in Saginaw Bay and we won't get it back. So there was this element of risk, this element of the unknown that really propelled them forward and, and kept the excitement going throughout the project. Oh, the video, yes, we're ready.
Sharon Derice put that video together with the help of Jenny Lennon, and they just did a phenomenal job. Lots of hours, so thank you very, very much for that. A lot of fun, too. Um, as you saw in our video, it wasn't just Sharon and I and our girls. You know, we had a lot of community helpers out there, and without them, I'm, I'm sure the project might have gotten off the ground, but we probably never would have found it. And I'd like to introduce them to you right now because um, I think they're here. And one is uh, Dr. Dennis Klippa, and he's the advisor. Stand up, I probably shouldn't move him up. He's the advisor at Central Middle School's Ham Radio Club, and he's the guy, our go-to guy, the first one we talked to about getting some help with tracking our balloon. And he brought on board um, uh, John Hutchison, who's the director of Midland County Search and Rescue. I think he's here. And Chris Rose, is Chris here? No, Chris Rose was also um, very important. He, he put out some major money to uh, purchase a high altitude tracker for us that we used along with all the ham radio equipment that everybody has in order to track our balloon. Um, we had multiple systems. We learned about having redundant systems on, on board to make sure um, we actually did find it again, and sure enough, our one system worked and the other system died about two blocks away. So we were very fortunate to have them um, on board with us, and we continue to enjoy their support as we uh, look at launching a second balloon sometime this summer <coughs> to get some of our experiments up off the ground. Um, I think I alluded to earlier that weight is an issue, and I'm not sure if you could quite see it in the video, but <laughs> we, we uh, had a couple of false launches where it would not go up, and we decided we have too much in there. And so we had to remove some of the experiments that we had, and we hope to relaunch our experiments and check those out hopefully in August here. Because we want the high school girls to have all their hours of hard work you know, come to fruition. So the I think we need to move one more slide here. Here we go. These are all the people that help make this whole process possible. And um, it's kind of an exhaustive list, and I'm not going to read it to you, but um, the thing that we just are overwhelmed by is this community that we live in and the richness of the community that we lived in. Um, the community of involvement ranged from people who donated helium. They gave us discounts on goods. Of course, the gentleman I introduced you to, um, hours and hours and hours and money out of their own pocket. Um, we know that uh, saying that it takes a village to raise a child, 
but I think it can be very easily extended to say that it takes a community to educate a child. And we are the proof of that. It took a lot of people to get our balloon off the ground and to get our program up and running. And we just want to say, you know, thank you to them. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> now Sharon's going to talk to you about what's next for our group. Mentioned um, a launch again in August, and since Central Middle School is closing, I will be at Jefferson Middle School next year. Bernadette will be at Northeast Middle School next year, and our plan is to have these clubs at both schools. The beauty of that is our students from Central are splitting and going to both middle schools. So as eighth graders, we'll be calling on them at each middle school to become leaders in the new group. And we would like to launch another balloon either combined with both middle schools or at each middle school in the fall so that they have the experience, they can show that leadership, and they can bring other girls uh, in, into the groups as well. So that's the short-term plan. Um, Long-term, we would like to get into some other projects besides just a, a weather balloon. And I shouldn't say just a weather balloon because this has been an amazing, incredible experience. Um, with the problem solving and with the things that didn't go as planned, our girls now see why you need to go through certain procedures, why you need to have a plan, why details matter. But there are lots of other projects out there dealing with LED lights, dealing with uh, wearable clothing that has computer assisted lights, music, what, whatever. But and we want the girls to get to the point where they come up with their ideas because the sky is the limit for them. And we want to be able to refer back to our balloon launch and say the sky is the limit. So that's, that's kind of our long-term plan. And we have a lot of learning to do ourselves. We both jumped into this not knowing a thing about weather balloons, not knowing a thing about radio, not knowing a thing about tracking GPS. And we're not afraid to ask questions. I think we're old, craggly teachers now at this point, <laughs> And we'll say, we need help, and who can help us? But I, I do want to reiterate what Bernadette said about you know the, the guys who helped us. We couldn't have done it without them. And they've been so generous and so giving. We talk a lot about technology. We talk about the computers. We talk about cell phones that kids have. We talk about the initiative that we want here with iPads, with computers. But what we've learned and what has become very, very clear is that it's the people connections that matter. These girls working together at lunchtime, I think you saw a lot of their joy in the video, waving and smiling. Who smiles when they're doing math? Who smiles when they're researching jet streams, when they're researching cloud cover? But they did. And when they saw the project take off, um, the joy there is incredible. Also, the joy from, that we've seen from all of the volunteers who've helped us, from my family members, Bernadette's family members, um, people in the community, people we've talked to as far away as Texas, as far away as Colorado, who are saying, yes, we want to be part of this. This is an incredible project. So the joy in their voices has been um, all the, all the pay that we need right now because it's so rewarding for us to see other people excited about kids learning. And to wrap up, we know that we have a treasure trove of talent and incredible resources in this community. And we saw, like Sharon said, the people that did get involved in our project, they were, the joy that they were experiencing that they expressed to us was just incredible. But we also know that what they gave to us in their help with our girls and with our project is absolutely immeasurable. So we feel that combined with our community and, and our resources and our girls that we are invincible. So thank you very much for your time and we hope you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you. Don't leave the podium. Uh, board members, your pleasure. Questions, I, have, I have some questions. First, let me say what a remarkable project. Mm -hmm. and, and kudos to you, and thank you for doing that. And to all the members of the community and those that are here who helped make this happen, um, I have three questions. Well, what kind of experiments did you guys run at 51,000 feet? 
Uh, I was a little unclear as to what exactly you guys put in the box. Second um, one is. We, we had a camera oh. at 51,000 feet. OK. <laughs> as, as we went to launch, um, as it was clear that the weight was too much, and we, we knew it the night before, but as the teachers, we couldn't fix it, um, we had to tear out. I mean, literally tear out as it's, as it's launching. Um, the high school girls have a solar display here. They wanted to uh, track the difference in voltage as it ascended and went you know, through, the, through the altitude. Uh, temperature probes also, and uh, barometric pressure, just to see exactly what is it and what's happening. You can look that up online. You can look at a chart from your physics teacher, but it's different when you have that actual data yourself. Um, so that's in the plans, and that's why we want to launch again in August. Today. What was their reaction to receiving that data? To receiving it? Yeah. We didn't get they, it. They, they didn't get the data. Okay, no. I'm, I'm sorry. They were disappointed, but, you know, they're, they're ready to go again. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that there was some things that didn't go as planned that they experienced. Can you comment a little more on what types of things occurred <laughs> that maybe they didn't expect? <laughs> There's a, like a big story with that. How long you got? Let, let me uh, ask you just my third question real quick. Did anybody bedazzle one of these computers? <laughs> <laughs> oh, not yet. They oh, I don't know. Time. Okay. No, but they no. will. Oh, they I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. Um, the things that went wrong, um, from the beginning, we touched the balloon and found out after we touched the balloon, there's a little note in the bottom of the box that says, don't touch the balloon without gloves and so we ordered a new balloon and that is why we have two balloons and why we're launching a little later with the one that we touched we also learned that um, if it's too heavy it won't go up high enough to pop um, it should have gone up in about two hours time and popped at 90,000 feet and um, since we weren't maybe as accurate as we needed to be on weighing everything and having a step list of exactly what we needed to do when um, we, our balloon only went to 51,000 feet. We figure a Canadian goose popped it. We have no idea why it popped. Um, it was not supposed to go to Canada. Our predictions, no. and there are all sorts of computer models and programs out there. It was supposed to land just north of Imlay City because it was going to ascend very quickly, and the whole flight was going to be three hours start mm -hmm. to finish. Five, six hours later, you know, we were tracking <laughs> it in Canada, 155 miles away. Uh, it actually landed 250 meters from the shore of Lake Erie. And it went right between the bay and Lake St. Clair. We were worried about it ending up in the bay. We didn't even consider Lake Erie. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's beautiful the way it all turned out. Um, one thing that maybe the high school students can be challenged to do is can they repeat that flight? And I'll let you talk a little bit about our Canadian friends and how it was, it was retrieved. Uh, when we realized that it was um, going to miss the bay, everybody cheered. We're all sitting at McDonald's in Vassar with uh, computers and our gentlemen friends there um, from Midland County Rescue and the ham radio clubs were helping to track and explain everything to the girls, what's going on. And um, we were happy that we were going to miss the bay. But then when it went over the Canadian border, you could have heard a pin drop in McDonald's because we thought, passports. no passports, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And um, who's going to retrieve it? And the concern, of course, that it goes into Lake Erie. So uh, we're calling the school. Uh, who do we know that's Canadian? Jen Lennon was born there. So we called a fellow teacher, and she called her cousin who lived right near where we thought the balloon was going. He was in Kentucky on vacation, <laughs> foiled. So she had the brilliant idea to call the local high school, West Lorne High School. And um, I was able to talk to an environmental sciences teacher there. His name was Michael Van Dyke. He was in the, the video. He said, sure, we'll go look for it. We've been training with our GPS devices. This is just the real world experiment that we really want to do with our kids here at the end of the school year. So he was going to commandeer a bus the next day and take all of his high schoolers out to go up and down the beach and assured me that the one student that lived on the beach was going to look there that night. Well, I don't think, oh, and he talked to the custodian. The custodian was a member of the local yacht slash mariners club in West Lorne. This is just south of London, Ontario. And he was calling up his buds to tell them to get in their boats and look for a pink box <laughs> floating in the water. So we're like, oh, you know, we have a $300 tracking device on here, possibly getting waterlogged. So we were so grateful for that support. 
And uh, Michael went down to the beach after work that day instead of going home just to see if it was, you know, floating out there. And he sees a car with five antennas sticking up out of it. And he thought, I wonder if that's a ham radio guy. And so he goes over to the car and he says, uh, you know, hey, I'm looking for a weather balloon. Have you seen a weather balloon out here? And the ham radio guy looks at Michael and says, so am I. And Michael says, well, this woman from Michigan called me and said she lost it. And the ham radio guy says, well, me and all my buddies have been tracking it all the way across Canada all day long, wondering what it is and <laughs> can we find it. So they were having a lot of fun throughout Canada. They were trying to get a hold of our Michigan um, ham radio people, but there's no directory and no communication between ham radio operators between the two countries. They've always wanted that, but they've never been able to, you know, find that connecting link. And so um, Michael, the teacher, gives um, Adam, we knew, learned later his name was Adam, um, the ham radio operator, my phone number. You know, if you find it, give this woman a call. She would like, like it back. And um, about an hour later, I was home after all this ordeal, taking the kids back, and uh, missed a phone call, saw it was from Canada, figured it was Michael Van Dyke, the teacher, called it back, and there was nothing on the other end of the line except this really obnoxious, loud beeping sound. And I thought, the box is calling me. <laughs> You know, we listen to that beeping sound for about an hour on the football field before we launch, so it's kind of embedded in your mind. But pretty soon a man's voice came on, and I said, Michael? You know, I figured it was the teacher. He said, no, this is Adam. And I thought, who is Adam, and what have you done with Michael? You know, that was my initial thought. But then he explained who he was and that they had had just a wonderful time tracking this balloon throughout Canada, trying to figure out what it was at first, and then deciding it was a balloon, and that he met Michael Van Dyke on the beach, and this teacher had given him the most recent latitude-longitude lines. So he had gone home, driven an hour home, driven an hour back, and got his, um, I think uh, Dr. Clipper would have to help me with what the, the, the things are called, but his ham radio devices to help him track, and found the balloon within minutes. And uh, due to the updated information that he had gotten from Michael Van Dyke. And the only reason Michael Van Dyke got the updated information is because Adam's car is a ham radio. He has a uh, ham radio in the trunk, he has all the antennas on the car, and he unwittingly, a digital repeater, he unwittingly, you know, had driven by the balloon. It came back to life and gave us new, new um, data new coordinates as to where it was. Michael was still at school and saw it because we had given him the website where he could track it. And so he was able to give it to, to Adam, the ham radio guy. He calls, I don't have a passport. <laughs> Sharon took her family to Canada <laughs> a couple of nights later, met him at a parking lot in the mall. And we did not tell customs <laughs> what we were retrieving <laughs> with, with all the Homeland Security, and I'm yeah. laughing, but you know, this flies 50,000 feet yep. over the border and ends up, you know, dropping in there. And with both countries in Homeland Security, both Adam and, and I said to each other, why haven't we gotten a call? Because we have a phone number on here. Michael. My assumption is they know they made some calls, they checked, they, they, they knew what it was. It was pink. But uh, we, were, <laughs> we were grilled at the border going into Canada and questioned, who is this guy? What's his name? I didn't have a last name. Adam, Adam who? Adam Smith. And my daughter in the back seat is going, oh my God. <laughs> well, how long have you known him? We just met. <laughs> how did you meet? <laughs> On the internet. <laughs> my husband's sitting next to me, straight face. <laughs> well, what are you doing? We're gonna have dinner at the Lambton Mall, which is nothing in the food court. <laughs> And the look on the guy's face was, what? <laughs> and, and then he wanted to know, well, how long are you going to be there? Uh, two hours <laughs> at a food court. And are you taking anything to this Adam, or are you bringing anything back? No. <laughs> no. So we got through. And we were grilled on the way back in also. So then they wanted to know what we were bringing back into the country. And we had stopped the duty-free shop because we knew that the Kit Kats in Canada were amazing. They're made with <laughs> real chocolate, not the waxy stuff here. <laughs> so we spent about $30 in Kit Kats, <laughs> left the bag on the back seat where the agent could see it coming back into the country. So when they asked us, we could truthfully say we're bringing back Kit Kats. <laughs> so 
yeah. it was a great time. Great time. So we have quite the story, the Lake Wobegon story of uh, the <laughs> Raspberry Pi Club. So any other questions? <laughs> I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm a female engineer. and um, Come and talk to our group, <laughs> please. <laughs> and, um, and I know middle school is such a critical time. And I also know just from my own experience now that, you know, a couple of things that my son did in middle school, my daughter just hadn't hasn't had an interest and part of it's just because it's all boys you know and as much as you know as much as you'd like to think they could do it together these type of things are just so important and thank you so much for all the effort that you You're put welcome. into this it's a pleasure i think a lot we of can fun. yeah we left a lot yeah. any others right here yeah jen yeah well maybe with you being at next year you can come up with a steering system right <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I think they're trying to right now design a system, right, yeah. Jack, to pop the balloon if should we go astray again. <laughs> We're trying to just figure out a system that way. So. Just a few things I wanted to say is that you're, you guys are really innovators in education. I just think of all the things that are going in the direction of project-based learning, and you find a way to engage kids. And you know, I think is you know eventually maybe we can have a new tech school, and it's just interesting at uh, a spark at Central Middle School is going to benefit two other buildings, and that spark and that inspiration could come back as a new tech program possibly in the future which is really inspiring and uh, being a, a, a coach of a robotics team that didn't, didn't really inspire my daughter who is uh, going to be a sixth grader next year but inspired my sons this is really neat and I, I'm with Angela as far as uh, finding something and that you know that just a way to engage kids in a way and you guys are really innovators as far as doing that and it's very exciting what you're doing um, but also you know some of the challenges you had you didn't have a budget stop you, you didn't have any of the challenges with time, and it really is a, a good community-based uh, program. And uh, that's what we need in education is nothing, no matter what the situation is, you find a way to get it done and find a way to engage, uh, engage uh, kids differently. And technology is one way to engage them. Thank you. I just wanted to speak to the central piece, and I, I don't think you did. Um, maybe you did. Stop me if I did that um, our central girls are split, you know, our central kids are split between Jefferson and Northeast. Oh, that they're going to be leaders. Yeah. You must have tuned out. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that <laughs> connection. I like too. that you both wore your raspberry colored clothes. Yes. 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 We know about marketing. We know about everything. A little bit of everything. Jack of all trades, master of a few. Well, well and lastly is the male engineer mm -hmm. at the table. Um, I had the privilege of working a number of years with the highest ranking female engineer at Dow Chemical Company, Carol Williams. Uh, Carol and I are pretty close. I'm going to talk to her about this project. Uh, Thank and if you. you I'll, I'll be looking to see if you're interested at all in young female engineers that work for Dow, that she might be eager to uh, get involved in this. So. And that, that is, you know, one of our long range plans is to bring people in to talk to the girls about what's happening. Um, just shortly before we did this, um, I was at Genji's and had dinner sitting next to somebody from marketing from one of the companies in town, talking about the fact that they're no longer doing the chemical engineering, but they're doing marketing and they're working on toys. Right. And it's, it's amazing. And, and just the stories of what she could share. And our intent was to have her and her partner come in and talk to the girls, but again, time just got away from us at the end but we knew that next year we'll have more time to do that kind of thing and we will appreciate anything that you can do to help us with here. those connections okay. thank you, okay. thank you. Else? just one last yep, comment Carl. I mean I want to thank Bernadette both you and Sharon what an incredible thing when I saw it I was so excited and I just said we have got to get you here in front of the community now for a good share of the summer where this is their last televised board meeting for a while so Great job. I'm so proud of you and glad you could make it tonight on relatively short notice. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, gee, we're going to go from the emotional to the exciting the to the budget. <laughs> Um, first. Oh, well, Carl, say is that sorry? I'm sorry, we have another item in front of that. I'm sorry. Yes. So, Carl, I'm going to turn it over to you on the work schedule adjustment for the interim Very superintendent. Good move to extend the time. <coughs> yeah, I could, we'll, I'll do that. For the uh, yes, as you see in the narrative for this item uh, that was in the board packet, um, Mr. Cooper is our interim associate superintendent, and we've made an introduction of him to my successor, Mr. Sharo, already. He understands the nature of that assignment. He also understands what 
strengths and expertise Mr. Cooper brings to that position. But because Mr. Cooper has been really doing this job and helping in the transition since the end of March, um, he actually would be embarrassed if I told you how many vacation and personal days he's actually going to sacrifice even if you grant this request. This, in my mind, is a modest request to extend his uh, vacation allowance by five days over what it would normally be and an additional personal business day. I'm hoping you'll support this because he's given to us in this district a lot more than he's going to get as a result of this motion. Anybody care to make a motion? Then we can have a discussion. So moved. Support. Moved by Secretary Kaminsky, supported by Mr. McFarland. Any questions or discussion? The only question I have is, is this a, a one-time five-day extension or is this a permanent extension no this is a one-time request oh just to bridge this year to the to the the 12 13 year to the 13 14 year okay yeah John? I, I just had to thanks thanks for working on the dual roles you're getting ready to go into a new role and you're pulling the full weight of the of the existing math coordinator and uh, your dedication to MPS is really appreciated Yvonne, yeah, no, I have no issues. I would support no. this if it was a permanent extension mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you need to take Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> we give it for a reason. And, yes. uh, and I also want to extend my thanks for your whole flexibility and understanding you've gone into this, Bob. Uh, you're a stellar performer and really, really appreciate what you've done for us and going into this thing. Thank you. With that, uh, we can do this with a voice vote. All in yes. favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. Use it. Yes, please. <laughs> Go refresh your Now we'll move on to to Linda. <coughs> and I don't know how I follow up flying squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go higher than 50, 51,000 yeah, 51, feet. 51,000 feet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep the 50,000 will be fine. <laughs> we'll try not to land in Lake Erie along the way. We actually have two budgets this evening. Uh, as you know, we have to adopt a final 12-13 budget that is as close to what we believe our actual revenues and expenditures will be. And then at the end of that, you'll be asked to take action on the 13-14 budget, which was presented at the last meeting. That's sometimes confusing to people who aren't used to school or governmental financing. But in our case, we adopt generally three budgets, one at the beginning of the year, one midway when things become a little clearer, and then one at the end of the year where we true up everything as closely as possible. So that's where we are right now. And so what we have to do, in some ways, this is the most nerve-wracking of all the budgets. You would think it would be the easiest because the year is almost over. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case because we have to estimate all the amounts that we still need to complete the year. And even though the school year is completed, we have a lot of expenditures yet to come. We have the July and August payroll accrual for our teachers. We have remaining medical and dental expenses. We have final payroll for hourly employees. We have money that's out on purchase cards. We have what's called encumbrances. Those were purchase orders that were written at some time during the year that have not been closed. Some of them will be closed with no expenditure, uh, but there may be others that still have expenditures to remain. And then we have utility bills. So at this point, we have 216,000 left is what I've budgeted for remaining medical costs. Another 249 for encumbrances and utilities. And then and for the upcoming payroll, because we have, we allow our teachers to spread their pay. They're not paid just during the school year, but they're paid throughout the year. We ha and we have one payroll remaining for our fiscal year staff. And so as a result of all that, we still have seven and a half million dollars of just payroll related charges that we haven't made yet. And believe it or not, that's nine percent of our entire budget that remains unexpended as we sit here with only four days left in this fiscal year. And that's on top of some of these other expenses. So that's what makes it challenging is doing the estimate for all of those expenses that remain. So before we get to the number, I do want to point out too that it's very important that at this point that our final spending doesn't exceed the amount that's budgeted. And that's not just in the bottom line, but as we spread it out through all of the functions. So it's not enough to say, well, medical expenses came in below budget. They have to come in below budget for 
elementary instruction, middle school, high school, all, all the way through the budget, all of those areas may not be overexpended. So as we go forward, these were the, the areas that concerned me and that could change in the next few weeks. Uh, we had in the budget as revenue a prior year Medicaid payment that's supposed to flow through the ESA of almost $300,000. And as of today, we've not received that, and I don't have any confirmation that we are. The last I'd heard was that there might be some portion of that coming, but because I haven't had confirmation, I don't feel good leaving $300,000 of uncertain revenue in the budget. I'll feel very good if we go through the audit, the money has come in, and we have to adjust our revenues upward a little. I'd much rather do that. It's always safer to underestimate revenues, overestimate expenditures, and that keeps us out of trouble. Uh, if the payment does come in any time within the 60 days of our year end, it will be reported as revenue, so it could potentially change the budget. Uh, we do have two weeks or a week in some days of medical bills that we will be paying. Uh, I left $216,000 in for that. Whether it will be adequate or not remains to be seen, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, we have our utilities for the month that will have to be paid, and we're estimating about 136000 there. And then the encumbrances are at 81000 So uh, the encumbrances, that's a maximum amount. That's likely to provide a little bit of relief because in most cases that's, those amounts will not be fully expended. Uh, utilities this time of year are typically, um, aren't likely to go over that, although they, our, our staff has estimated using last year at this time. Medical, I, I would hope not, but it's certainly there's a risk there. And the risk on the Medicaid side is purely positive at this point. If it comes, it's additional revenue for us. Now, in the past, we would reduce the federal revenues and expenditures to reflect the amount that we thought we would carry over. The federal fiscal year is October 1 through September 30. Uh, but this year, we were advised by the state to leave the federal accounts at the original allocation and then not make the adjustment until the audit. I don't like that because we know we are planning for carryover. And so at this point, the revenues and expenditures that you'll see in the budget are about $450,000 higher than they will be when we close the fiscal year. And I don't like that because it means that I'm in a position of having to report to you uh, at the end of the audit why revenues are less and why expenditures are less. But the good news is, is that the net effect is zero because the two have to absolutely match. So here's the picture. We started out at the year 75.6.7 million uh, in revenues, popped up in February, and you'll see we popped up again in June. And I'll go into some of the details behind these in a minute. Expenditures have gradually moved down, which is the way that we would expect the trend to happen. And the anticipated shortfall has reduced. And I do want to point out that that's the anticipated shortfall, not if you're trying to do the math and say, well, wait a minute, if I subtract expenditures from revenues, I don't get that number except in the last column. That's because we've used a 3.5% total variance for the original budget and the February budget. And of course, in the June budget, there's no variance left to estimate other than those small items that I indicated earlier. So over the course of the year, the amount of the ending fund balance had increased from the beginning to February and then from February to June, very, very close. Uh, the percent of that fund balances of expenditures actually crept up, even though fund balance may be slightly smaller, because you can see that expenditures are smaller as well. So here are the sources of the revenue changes. And as I mentioned at the last meeting, there's always a shift between local and state as a result of changes in taxable values. So uh, trying to draw any sort of conclusion by looking at any one of those isn't particularly meaningful. Uh, but you'll notice that the variance there from, or the difference from February to June was a 0.9%. 
And that was a variance very close to what I had reported when I brought you the 13-14 budget. Now here's what's behind it. I did remove the prior year Medicaid reimbursement from revenues. Uh, I did have to add that MIPSR's rate cap categorical that I mentioned in the 13-14 budget. For this year, it we, it's been reported that we are going to receive $899,000 of money for which we will be immediately billed that we have to pay MIPSR's, the, the retirement system. So there's an equal amount built in on the expense side. So sadly, that's not extra money to us. It did nothing to affect fund balance, but it did significantly change our revenues and to extent our expenses. And then on, in state aid, we also had a prior year revision to Section 24. That's money that supports the juvenile care center, and that's a state aid categorical. And that's a number that's determined by formula, and it's designed to cover costs from the previous year. So again, this isn't really extra money, but it's money that covers expenses that were incurred in the 11-12 year. And our agreement with the county is that if this money added to the previous monies that we received are inadequate, the county has to make up the difference. So this is a number that's really very, very important to the county. To us, it, it really just means that there's a wash. Uh, but for the county, it means that the costs were fully covered and that they, they have no extra payment that they have to make to us. Now, if we back up some of the changes that took place between June and February, just as reminders, we had the technology infrastructure grant. We had some changes in state categoricals. Uh, we had an increase in the amount of what we expect to see from the Act 18 special education millage distributed from the ESA. We had that very large ESA prior year adjustment of over 600,000. Uh, federal grants were up, and then we had that one-time money to upgrade the TV equipment that came to us from the city. So those were some of the changes between June to February. So really... Uh, Minimal changes on the revenue side in terms of number, but one very large one that unfortunately had no effect on the bottom line. So the expenditure budget is far more complex than the revenue budget. And in total, there were 900, we had 937 budgeted expenditure accounts, and we made changes in 436 of them. Uh, in part, that's just the nature of how we are required to do our budgeting. Far more detail on the expenditure side than on the revenue side. Uh, but I will say that the adjustments fall into just a few main categories, and the largest, as you know, relates to employee costs, which are 85% of the budget. And those are salaries and wages, and then benefits. And the benefits really fall into two categories, health and payroll taxes. And for purposes of looking at expenditure changes, this is always more meaningful to me because when I talk about reducing our medical expenses, it ripples through virtually every category of the budget. And it may mean 15, 20, 25 different line, line item changes, but it's easier to talk about in total because the, the magnitude of the change remains similar wherever it is. So for wages alone, there are 45 different classifications, and this includes contractual retirement stipends and wages for any substitute teachers not contracted through our third party. And just as an aside here, beginning with January of this year, January 2013, we now have to pay retirement, uh, uh, not the full retirement amount, but about 21% of any wages that we pay to a substitute teacher who's retired and not going through the third party. So that was a little increase on the, the benefit side. And if we've done a good job, we have money remaining at the end of the year. And that might be because we had snow days, which were unpaid for hourly staff. We might have positions that were vacant or filled by long-term substitutes. And in some cases, those substitutes are being paid while the staffer is being paid. But in cases of staff taking family medical leave, uh, we have a staff person who's not being paid while the substitute is. And so the costs are usually significantly reduced. 
and we might have fewer retirements. There's vacancies that occur mid-year. There's a lot of good reasons why salaries should come in somewhat lower at the end of the year. Now, on the benefit side, we have anything uh, that we consider a, a health or medical benefit would be life, disability, medical, accident, dental, and vision. Then we have payroll taxes for the retirement system and Social Security and Medicare. We have workers' comp, and we have unemployment. And we are self-funded for medical, dental, and workers' comp. And of course, the largest component of uh, the medical side are the true medical, the health costs, and the largest component of the payroll taxes would be the payments to the retirement system. And on the medical, we pay weekly. Most of these we pay on a monthly basis, but medical we pay weekly. And as we sit tonight, we have one week in a few days that we will be billed for. And the weekly amount fluctuates. Just within the past month, since the beginning of May through our payment last week, we had one week where our payment was $51,000. And we had last week a payment of $275,000, which caused me to revise all of the medical accounts in the budget <laughs> uh, based on <coughs> that because I realized I had not left enough to cover what I thought the remaining expenses would be. The weekly average across the year has been 119000 so I used, rounded up, used 120000 as my weekly estimate, and so we have one week and a few days, hence 216000 remains in the medical account. So if we have a 275,000 day or week this week, I am not going to be a very happy camper because I'll know that we exceeded what I had budgeted, regardless of what the final week is. But um, liking to get the budget as close as possible so we don't have surprises when we get to the audit, I've, I've really tried to squeeze it down. Quite honestly, my comfort level would have been to say, ah, let's leave half a million there, then I know I'm good. Uh, but I really can't justify thinking that there'll be a half million there. Uh, and this is what the medical does look like because it was one of my largest adjustments this year. And we talked about this a little bit in the context of the 13-14 budget. These are annualized amounts that are provided by Connect Care, and PMPM stands for per member per month. And you'll note that the medical expense, which is just the dark gray bar estimated for our fiscal year, is really the s lowest that it has been since 2002-03. Overall expenses aren't quite as low because the pharmacy costs are higher, but just the medical portion is at a very low level. And as a result, I ended up over all the accounts adjusting out about 800000 of medical expenses this year. And I don't have hard data to support how much of this is plan design and how much is usage. But we did make some changes in our deductibles and co-pays this year. Many of them were uh, the result of our, our teacher's contract ratified a year ago. And I have to believe that that helps to some degree. But it's very hard to tease out how much of the savings would be attributable to that and how much was just the good fortune of all the, the members in the plan. But that's where we are, and that is the starting point for next year's budget. So we were able to start with a, a little lower number than we would have if we'd had to budget off of the 0809 numbers. So on the expenditure side, breaking it down into the big categories, you can see where the changes are. And although I put them on there, the percent changes aren't particularly meaningful because there's such a huge disparity in size between the categories. The first two are 85% of the entire budget, and everything else is 15%. And so 10% of a smaller number, you know, it's just, just hard to make a comparison. And it's not apparent here because it, you'll see that the benefits number went down but that is the area of both the largest increase and the largest decrease in the entire budget. That 899000 of MIPSR's prefunding had to be recorded there, although because wages were down somewhat, 
payroll taxes also were down, so it didn't have to be the full 899000 And then the medical accounts were reduced by 786000 uh, But altogether, that resulted in uh, a somewhat, as, as all the accounts were reduced down, a uh, reduction in the benefits category. But it came from two very, very large increases of pretty close to 1% of the entire budget and swing in, in each direction. Uh, and if you remember, the revenue variance was 0.9. And you'll see the expenditure variance was 2.6% together, 3.5, which is why we've ended up very close to where the February projection was. Uh, and some of the previous changes, just as a reminder, how did we get from June to February? Because that's really where some of the big changes took place. Uh, we had reductions in the payroll rate. We started the year thinking that the payroll rate was going to be 27%. And then as a result of reform efforts for most of the year, it had dropped down to 24%. Now adding that 899000 took it back up. So it probably could have left it where it was. Uh, but that was one of the big changes. <clears throat> we had some retiree allowances that we were shifting. Uh, we pay them differently, so they've been moving from the category of salaries to benefits. Uh, we reduced the amount for paraprofessionals, and we'd also been advised by the ESA that the tuition charges to us would be slightly smaller. Uh, on the other hand, our increases were with the uh, federal programs, and those get scattered throughout the budget. So they're very hard to see looking at it in this format. But if you looked back at the revenue and saw what the federal revenue <coughs> budget was, you would see that amount that could be spread through here. We also had some increases in classroom teachers, some IB-related costs. Workers' comp was up. Uh, we had some gifts that had been carried over from 1112, and then we had the TV money that, that we had in there that were all increases in the current budget. A decrease that happens at this time of year is any budgeted gift money that has not, you know, we just put a, a plug figure in the budget. Typically, if 200,000 for general fund or for non athletic gifts and 50,000 for athletic gifts. Those numbers get adjusted up or down depending on whether we've received that much or not. And so on the, the regular gifts, I know that number had to be adjusted down. Athletic gifts, I think, exceeded the budget figure. Uh, but it, again, it's on the revenue and expense side, so there's no effect on fund balance, but it may be reflected in the numbers that you're seeing here. So what did that do to fund balance? This is the history over the last year, or number of years, actually a little more than a decade. Uh, and I added for you the, the very last bar is the estimate for the 13-14 budget as well, just so you can get a picture of what's been happening to our fund balance. So next year's estimate, again, uses that 3.5% variance. Without it, next year's bar would be larger. Next year's bar would actually go off the bottom of the chart down to about six million. Uh, but as you can see, the variance, we although it's always in a different place, the variance has proven to be a, a pretty solid number over the years. So we do expect for this year to take more out of fund balance than we did last year and somewhat more next year. And I'll leave you with this picture because it allows you to look at both this year's budget and then as you're going forward to 1314. Uh, this would be the revised budget for 1213. Revenue seventy-seven million six hundred forty-six thousand four hundred twenty-four dollars. Expenditures eighty million thirteen thousand one hundred three. And very likely, if there's any additional variance, barring that 300000 that could come in for the Medicaid settlement, on the expenditure side, last year at this time I was telling you there could be a variance of up to 700000 750000 and I think that's about where it came in. Right now, it's, I've squeezed it down to it's about one hundred fifty, maybe 250000 So the numbers that you see now should be pretty close to where they are 
come audit time. So the shortfall, $2,366,679, which will leave the fund balance at $10,861,883, or 13.6% of this year's expenses. And then for 1314, which we talked about in detail at the last meeting, you can see the figures there. Revenues expected to be down, and you remember that of those revenues, 2.2 million is that MIPSERS pre-funding. So both revenues and expenditures would have been lower numbers without that for 1314. So I would ask that you approve the 1213 budget. Motion. Move. I move. We approve the 1213. Budget. Moved by Treasurer Branstad, seconded by Member Gordon. Um, questions? Linda, did I hear you say um, we still haven't heard final numbers from the ESA and the Medicaid disbursement yet? That is correct. And we've made that request on multiple occasions. Mm -hmm. And I just want our board and our community to understand that Reasonably, those should be numbers that we should have by now. Yep. And typically, we, we always have them by the time the board adopts the amended budget for the current year you're in. Yep. And Thank it's you. not for re not asking repeatedly on our and part. Carl, thanks for bringing that forward. Ed, apropos, we obviously were concerned about the integrity of what's going to happen there, not in terms of personal integrity, but what is the number going to be, what the number is going to be. And the timeline. And the timeliness that. thereof. And so uh, beseech them to come to a quick answer for us. And here are the questions or comments on this year's budget. Yeah, Linda, thanks for watching this closely. You've been revising and updating and tracking all the changes, and I, I know that uh, you're trying to get it as accurate as possible to hit a moving target. Um, and we would get a lot of scrutiny as a board and as an organization. And uh, I mean, we're getting much closer to the budget to the actual. And I mean, you're leaving like no money in accounts and watching things right to the end, down to the week. So it's appreciated. Thank you. It's not easy to hit a moving target. Yes. Always amazes me how well we do it with this. The, the only thing I point out to the public and the rest of the board, which is obvious, we're going to have to take actions. You can't keep leading with two and a half million dollars a year and not run out of fund balance. So the inevitable is coming, and we're going to have to deal with it. Carl won't have to deal with it, but uh, <laughs> we will have to deal with it. No, it's probably worth mentioning too that I mean, some people could say, "Why didn't we do something about that this year?" We talked about that at the board uh, budget workshop back in April. And while there was some risk in this, we all felt it was a risk worth taking, and that was if we'd had a successful election. Yep. Not only would that have helped immediately um, with some summer tax collections coming up, but it had the potential to bring $70 million of relief to this general fund budget if mm -hmm. you assumed we, we still have to spend that money anyway over a 10-year period of time. So I think that was a measured risk worth taking but it certainly has implications in the future. And, and Carl, to that point, Linda, I, I hate to put you on the spot um, for number grabbing, but I always had in my head that the the millage would have relieved the annual budget for technology infrastructure stuff of about three quarter of a million dollars. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that would have been three quarter of a million to the better yeah. as we go forward. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Can I add one thing to that? Actually looking at what's on the, the agenda. As far as as far as as we go forward, new superintendent coming on board, looking at things in the fall and so forth. Um, depending on if we regroup when we go back and um, look at funding for technology and so forth, sinking fund, is it always possible we could do a mid-year adjustment? I mean, if, you know, when we look at the thirteen fourteen, it, it it may get to be that we have a more accurate idea of, of how that's going to be, depending on where technology funding is going and so forth. Yes, in fact, as soon as we have an event that would significantly change the budget on either the revenue or the expenditure side, we're legally required to do an amendment. Okay. So if something happens. So although nothing's mm -hmm. happening now, yeah. it yeah, may be something. in a number of months coming forward that we evaluate our, our budget going forward and, and decide we have possibly some changes to it. Yes. So. We, we've traditionally done a mid-year adjustment just because by then more information is a little clearer. Uh, we're not required to do that, but if there's something that significantly changes it, we are. 
Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, we'll vote in. We could do this by uh, voice vote. Um, all in favor of adopting the 2012 2013 final budget adjustments for our presentation say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, Carl, 13 14. Yeah, other than the screen you look at, we don't review the detail of the 13-14 budget two um, meetings in a row. We did that two weeks ago. Uh, we provided a hearing for the public. Uh, we posted that hearing previously. The, uh, we mentioned at that meeting there was the opportunity for the public to come during audience to visitors to this. No one spoke about it tonight. I don't think Linda or Cindy, we had anybody from the community no. contact our respective offices about it. So what we bring to you is the adoption of the budget that we presented two weeks ago for 13-14. Can I take a motion? I want to move to um, accept the operating budget for 2013 and 14. Move, right. move by Secretary Kaminsky, supported by Treasurer Branstad. Any questions or comments on this one that aren't repetitive of what we just talked about for this year? No, we still have challenges. Yep. All right, with that in mind, uh, we'll take a voice vote on accepting the 13-14 operating budget. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, at this point in the agenda, I'll accept a motion to extend our meeting time from 9.30. I think we'll be done by 10, but let's say 10.15, just in case, so we don't have to do it again. So moved. Support. Okay, so we have a move. Uh, Motion by Secretary Kaminsky, support by Treasurer Branstad on extending the meeting to 1015. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. I'll turn it over now to Mr. Allinger. Well, always at this time of year, we announce the uh, following 2013 scholarships from the respective high schools. And um, this is a fun part of the job because there's a lot of money associated with this that I think will shock. Uh, uh, some of our community members. So there's a list of probably close to a couple dozen, so I beg your patience as I read these, but it gives not only recognition to the students that receive the scholarship, but also the honor and the memorial to those who uh, frequently set them up. And the Joe uh, Blase Scholarship is awarded to Kevin D. Morse, who is a 12th grade student at Dow High. The Chester L. and Blanche L. Cohen Scholarship is awarded to Joseph Ryan, 12th grader at Midland High. The Earl Engweis Scholarship is awarded to Sylvia Clausen, 12th grade student at Midland High. The Grand Rapids Building Services Award is given to Hannah Fisher, who is a 12th grade student at Midland High, and Joseph Decker, a 12th grade student at Dow High. The Paula K. Paula K. Kellen, Kellen Scholarship is awarded to Matthew Lopez, 12th grade student at Midland High. The James E. Karenin Scholarship is awarded to Kara Feruzzi, an eighth grade uh, student, and Kelsey Dice, a sixth grade. Both of these students are from Northeast Middle School. The Lindsay Scheel Scholarship is awarded to Laura Heinrich, Heinrich, a 12th grade student at Midland High. The Mallon H. Moore Scholarship is awarded to David F. Reed, 12th grade student at Dow High. The Tony Ahora Scholarship is awarded to Christine Mussel, 12th grade student at Dow High. The George and Shirley Owen Scholarship, <coughs> excuse me, is awarded to Anna Doreen, a 12th grade student at Dow High. The Tom Stern Scholarship is awarded to Terrence Thomas, 12th grader at Midland High. The Charles Trzinski Scholarship is given this year to Dylan Matthews, uh, Midland High 12th grader. The Stephen Zazula Scholarship is awarded to Melissa Bishop, 10th grade student at Dow High, and Alexis Warmbier, 11th grade student at Dow High. The Dow High Student Council Scholarships are awarded to 12th grade student Alan Corbet. The Midland High School Student uh, uh, Council Scholarship is awarded to Midland High seniors. Dylan Matthews, Zoe Bucci, Benjamin Yates, Yates, pardon me, and Deborah Berry. The Roy L. McNeil Scholarship is awarded to Andrew Holland, a Dow High 12th grader. The Midland High Business Education Scholarship is awarded to Catherine Ortega. 12th grade student at Midland High. The William Dixon Scholarship is awarded to Caitlin McPhillips, 12th grade student at Midland High, and Ashley Burr, 12th grade student at Dow High, and to Joseph Decker, a 12th grade student at Dow High. And the Mary and Fred Coulter Family Scholarship is awarded to Thomas Crawford, a 12th grade student at Dow High as well. 
In addition, uh, we are proud to report from Mrs. Castle uh, from Dow High that their graduating class has received more than $8.4 million in scholarship dollars. And Mrs. Greif, the principal at Midland High, has reported that the MHS graduating class has been awarded more than $6 million in scholarship money, which means that Midland Public Schools 2013 graduates have been awarded more than $14.4 million in scholarship money to accomplish their entire post-secondary academic goals. That is very, very impressive. We want to congratulate our graduates. We wish you all the best. Wow. Pretty amazing. They're great students. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, Carl. Uh, we'll move on to finance, and I'll turn it back over to Linda, I assume. Yep. Yes, we have some gifts. The first are donations of musical instruments. Mark and Mary Bassett donated a Con 20B trumpet and Barbara Ruberg a Yamaha flute. Uh, then we also have gifts for the 13-14 year, which are deferred, uh, but we have received and processed them. They total $300 and one is a matching gift to the other. Uh, the first came from Ruth Ann Wright, and it's a donation to support the classroom at Chestnut Hill for the Upper Cognitively Impaired uh, group, and then that is matched by the Rollin M. Gerstacker Foundation. And I know uh, in the past, I, I'm not certain, but I would imagine that Ms. Wright is a trustee because I believe that the Gerstacker Foundation has a program whereby they match the gifts made by their uh, trustees. Then we do have a gift that requires your acceptance. It is $5,000 from the Dow Chemical Company Foundation, and that is to support the Dow High School Youth in Government Program. Anyone care to make a motion? I move we accept the um, $5,000 from the Dow Chemical Company Foundation. Support. Moved and supported. Uh, we to give it to Treasurer Branstad and Member McFarland this time. Yep. Um, any questions or discussion on the item? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely, thank you. I was waiting to reserve your <coughs> comments as president to be last, but thank you. Um, all in favor of accepting, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Linda. All right, and this is one of those reasons why we held back some of the sinking fund dollars. Bids have been accepted, and a tabulation is provided for the grounds building roof replacement which was one of those things that we had scheduled, thought perhaps that we could put it off, and this spring's rains made it very clear that we couldn't. It in the project includes total removal of the old roof and replacement with new EPDM membrane system, and the project is scheduled to be completed this summer. We recommend issuing a purchase order to the low bidder Brandle Roofing of Midland for $30,000 and this would be funded with the remaining sinking fund dollars. Motion. I move with that we accept item number 6.2 to put a new roof on the, um, what is it, the grounds building. Support. Support from Yvonne. Support, sorry. <laughs> Any questions or discussion? It's, it's nice that uh, we found a contractor in Midland to do the roof. It's very nice. Yep. Somebody local. Any others? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Move on to Mr. Verlindy and we have some items on technology. And Gary, why don't we combine them all? Yeah, I was going to suggest that same thing and uh, I was going to uh, give you a context for all of these. Yep. Okay. Um, last year, um, as you well remember, we did the iPad initiative. And we invested in 570 uh, iPads for elementary grade students so we could get some of that experience. You, you also remember that that was done from general fund money that was allocated in the technology budget for last year. However, we, it was reprioritized, so we put off replacing computer labs uh, in the context of number one, doing the initiative, and number two, some of these labs may not. Uh, uh, eventually need to be replaced and we wanted to wait and see in the context of a one-on-one -on -one initiative and as you referenced earlier before if that technology bond had passed uh, we uh, would be going forward with any capital outlay being uh, paid for out of that bond proposal which obviously failed 
So what we have this year is a technology uh, budget for capital outlay um, at the same levels as last year and the year before. It's not an increase, okay, except for now uh, the repurposing is going back a, a ways to do some of the things that we put off doing last year because, as you are well aware, technology doesn't, uh, isn't a capital investment that you can wait to replace 20 years from now, okay? So we lost... Uh, a year of replacement the computers we're going to be replacing here as part of this package are going into their seventh year and then you start running into all kinds of memory problems conflicts operating systems uh, etc so we want to catch up on some of that but we don't want to lose um, a couple things we don't want to lose some of the uh, impetus and research on the um, the iPads uh, in case we go forward with that that decision obviously is yet to be made and any spending that we want to do on getting caught up on uh, some of these labs that we didn't replace we don't want ever to be lost dollars should we have another uh, tech uh, bond proposal in the future and if we purchase things now that are inconsistent with a pl uh, technology plan you know a case of a one-on-one -on -one initiative especially in the case of general usage computer labs we don't want lost dollars down the road we want to be able to use everything that we're using now. Where, what does that most specifically point to? In a lot of cases, it talks about not purchasing all these desktops for computer labs, but rather moving to a laptop model, freeing up some classroom space, um, having them be mobile and can go into classrooms and rather than kids going into uh, computer labs because the desktop uh, model, if we go to a one-on-one -on -one initiative at any level, uh, for general use labs, I'm not talking about CAD labs, et cetera, um, uh, the desktops, if we don't need those anymore, it's not that easy to repurpose them throughout the district and not lose those dollars. So the long and short of it is we're taking a lot of the labs that are general use computer labs and replacing them with uh, laptop labs and carts, okay, to keep that replacement cycle going. We free up some classroom space, which is needed at some of the buildings. And thirdly, if in the future we go with, uh, just like we did with our tech bond proposal, uh, proposal for one-on-one -on -one initiative, these laptops, if those general use labs are no longer needed, those laptops can be repurposed as part of the recycling of the laptops we do uh, every seven years with teachers. So there would be no lost dollars. One other thing that I would point out is we do have a couple labs here, however, that you will see on uh, um, page six that are going to be uh, ALI desktops because those are labs in which there are specific needs for high power, more high powered computers uh, and desktops. Um, and so it's replacing them. So if you take a look at the schedule of replacement on pages five and six, it's Adams, uh, the 30 laptops and the cart, Carpenter, Chestnut Hill, East Lawn, uh, and Plymouth for our elementaries. You may ask, where is Siebert? We did that on last year's budget at the last board meeting uh, so we could get a, a, a fast start on that one this summer. And then uh, um, you won't see Woodcrest, and the main reason you don't see Woodcrest is any, on any of those last weeks or this is because we did this exact same thing at Woodcrest a couple of years ago when we consolidated to make sure we had enough room and we bought a car at that time. That'll need to be replaced probably in three years, four years or so, uh, but they're not needing a replacement now. We also then are going to do laptops for a room over at Northeast, which will be very valuable with the consolidation. Next year will be the uh, most crowded year at Northeast, but we pick up a room there. We're moving that lab, actually, the computer, the uh, laptops into the media center where we could be beginning of a uh, access to that and maybe an iPad cafe or a laptop cafe uh, in our media centers, which is a concept we have been thinking about. And then Midland High and Dow High is mixed. We have a couple labs that are general use that are laptops and the others are uh, desktops. The one last thing that I will point out to you is item 7.4. We'd like to um, continue on with our iPad initiative, um, getting that research uh, going forward. We um, have on the elementary side, we are going to have those laptops that we had, um, 
those iPads that we had this year with elementary at different grade levels, we're going to keep them in those same grade levels. Obviously, the kids will change, but the teachers have that experience, and we are working with them so that we now are going to go to the next level of use of the iPads, try some newer things, uh, because last year was uh, learning uh, the different types of apps, but we want to take it to the next level as well. So we are going to continue that research. We have done a survey. You'll be getting a copy of that survey of parents, uh, teachers, students, and administrators. And uh, also we are uh, examining already um, testing data in the grades that had the iPads versus other grades. So uh, we're going to continue basically what we started last year uh, as far as that research. However, we want to broaden the footprint and get some additional experience for the future. So uh, item uh, 7.4 is about purchasing 156 fourth generation iPads for the secondaries. And this is not across all grade levels. It's not as big of an initiative because we have other needs as well. Uh, but what we are going to do is we are going to, in each secondary, have a uh, set of um, 32 uh, um, iPads uh, at each building in a charging cart um, at that building. And we're going to experiment with sharing a set of iPads amongst two teachers to get some of that experience. So two teachers are being selected at each elementary building, they'll have the, uh, at each secondary building. They'll each have a cart. Their kids will use that. They won't take them home because it's going to be shared use. So we're going to explore a little bit about shared use of this in case that's an option uh, going forward. Also, at each of the secondary schools, we're offering an opportunity for uh, teachers to have, to give them an iPad, some teachers, I think the total is five, is that correct? In, uh, in addition to this CART project, or is it seven? Uh, like seven. Um, to um, get more experience at the secondary level, get a secondary teacher's perspective on the iPad, and not just to have it to use for mail and that type of thing, but to use it as an instructional tool, even though the kids won't have it in that classroom. We had explained before about mirroring and teaching off the iPad to the projection screen and uh, use it as more of a presentation uh, type of device and get some more experience with that. And so it's a, um, a small step toward uh, getting some experience in the secondary, but it's one we can afford right now and one I think we shouldn't lose momentum in moving into the secondary. So 7.4 is really about purchasing some uh, iPads for individual teachers, but mostly those are carts um, for each secondary building. Questions? Thank you. Um, take, a, take a motion on it first, and we'll go into questions and comments. And if, you, if you're comfortable, uh, give a motion for all, all four. Yeah. I'd like to move approval on uh, technology agenda item 7.1. 7.2, 7.3, and 7.4. Support. Moved by Secretary Kaminsky. Support by Treasurer Brandstad on 7.1 through 7.4 inclusive. Uh, any questions or comments for Gary? I no. do. I do. I, you know, I realize that we're getting back on track uh, with the technology plan, and and some of these upgrades can't they can't wait. I mean, you know, Mr. Sobel, I know that you know we put this stuff off, and you know, you know the education. Um, uses for those computers in these all these many school buildings is definitely going to be um, it, it just can't wait and so you know it just illustrates that our technology needs are, are definitely going to be staring us in the face even though our general fund is not allowing us to implement and uh, be able to have our full technology uh, plan and so you know I, I think that this is a this is a balance trying to do what we can um, but also if we can go to one-to-one -one, I, I like <coughs> your th forethought and looking at how these can be repurposed. I mean, that's very good thinking. Um, but we're, we're looking at the digital classroom that's going to be coming no matter what, what that's going to look like. One-to-one uh, -one computing um, is going gonna, is gonna to be um, more and more of a factor to making us meet our goals. And I like the, the piece about the iPads. We're, we're preparing an, an ongoing preparation to, uh, for the digital classroom. So I, I would like to do more. I'd like for some of the pressure to be taken off the general fund. But I think it's a... I think it's a reasonable, good step for right now. We're doing the best we can. And it's a good opportunity to show the public and our community that we really need that bond when yeah. it comes around again. And if it comes around again, 
the good that it really will do our, our schools and our community at large. Nice job putting this together, Gary. Thank you. I should also point out that this is a first use of the 21 spot contract, uh, which is uh, a state initiative to get to bid out uh, uh, prices on uh, many of these computers uh, across the state and get a, a price. And then with the legislation that was written, we can get a rebate on um, the cost of these things. So we're getting some of these uh, computers um, at a very reasonable price. In some cases, we've had a change from a uh, Hewlett Packard to a uh, Dell because that's what was on there. Some of the desktops may not be available, but we're saving some significant money uh, as a result of that state contract. We're saving almost $16,000, right? It's $100 per unit, and we're purchasing 156 I want to The max of 100 per unit. But we're doing the others. That's your call. What happens with all the old computers that are being replaced? What we do is uh, um, we store them uh, over here until we can process them, and um, then we recycle them. We, we work with a company to recycle. They, they just get destroyed? Correct. Is there any way to wipe the drives and give them to members of the community that you know, may be able to use them? I mean, they don't need a high-tech computer, but maybe any computer. Part of the problem is, is that uh, um, do, the only way to really be sure that all the data on the hard drive is um, secured is to shred them. Okay. That's the hard part. And, and I think I had asked in our <coughs> FFO meeting too, when someone says to me, why? Why do we have to buy them right now? It's because a lot of these have gotten to the point where they're not reliable and where even though I think I have a classroom of 30 computers when I go in there and some of them aren't working I don't really have a classroom with 30 computers. When Plus I we have some computers that we can't put anything but Windows XP on at this stage. That's, yeah. good, that's a good point. Yeah. You, you don't really have For the point of obsolescence. Right, right. And, uh, <coughs> as we said and just as a reminder as we vote um, uh, one of the computer lab upgrades is for 75000 and change. The other is for 299000 and change. The other is 101000 and the other is about 75000 just to put that out there. We all get to see it. I just wanted everybody to, to hear the amounts. Well, it's already part of our technology it's budget. already part of our year. technology this isn't budget. This is in addition. Yep. This is something that and we it, it's just keeping, knew was necessary. And let's be abundantly clear. It's really keeping the capability we have, yet gets us a little more room in some of the buildings gives us a little more portability in some of our buildings and lets us a small amount, 75,000, lets us dabble in understanding at the secondary level what we can do. Exactly. And overall, we get to also understand how well the iPad can be um, exponentially learned upon in the second year of operation. So, good summary. Yeah, it's well said. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other comments or questions? <laughs> no. Okay, that said, we'll move into a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Um, moving on to the rest of the agenda, you'll see scheduled activities. I would like to note a change from the last <coughs> meeting, our July meeting, which historically was a um, organizing meeting. That's all, now January with the November elections and January 1 uh, term starts. So this is just a regular meeting at 7 o'clock, regular time, regular kind of agenda. For the civic block meeting on July 15th. Uh, there were a couple board members that could not attend. Also, this makes it easier for the board members to attend by going to the 7 o'clock when there was no special organizational aspect to it. That uh, said, that moves us into the study discussion session by board members. Um, if you're missing tonight, Lynn made her comments last week. And so I will start with comments from Scott tonight. Okay. Carl, your last meeting. Ooh. This is, yeah, <laughs> I see the weight just falling off your shoulders as we get closer to 10 o'clock. Um, you know, I've only been able to work with you in this capacity for about six months, and it's uh, a little disappointing because I was looking forward to several years of working with you. And what a tribute tonight has been uh, to see these pillars of the community come in and just sing your praises. It's been wonderful and uh, really a testament to who you are and who you represent. Um, and in six months, I wholeheartedly believe everything they say and just knowing you. Um, and, and I've grown to respect you, 
to admire you and to consider you a friend. So with that, um, the senior members of the board, I'm sure, have much more to say because they've, they've known you for a lot longer. Uh, but I wish you well, and I will continue to see you at Rotary, and uh, enjoy your retirement. Thanks, it's, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Angela. All right, well, first, before I turn on Carl, <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Um, end of the school year, thanks to all my children's teachers, all my children, my two children, just for another <laughs> wonderful, wonderful year. Um, just I can't say enough good about for both of them. At um, their two respective schools. It's just been another fabulous year, and I credit the teachers so much for that. Um, and to Carl, we actually, I'm still relatively new on the board, but um, I have so grown to appreciate the enormity of your job from being in this role and all you've had to handle in the last six years. We've had so many challenges, but when I think back to we moved here eight years ago, and one of the biggest reasons we moved here was for the school system. And eight years later, even with everything we've gone through, I, I still believe we have just the best school system here. And it has yeah. just been such a blessing for my kids to still be in it. And of course, I mean, that's one of the reasons I wanted to be on the board, just to give back, because it has just been such a blessing for my kids to be able to grow up in this environment. And I thank you so much for everything you've done. And you've just done it with such class. And you, I, I don't know if I could have done it as well as you <laughs> have, you know, I'm sure had to just, just with the class that you've had to do with all the challenges we've had. So thank you so much, and I wish you just all the best in your retirement. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay, on to me. Um, Kathy, I'll start with you. Uh, Dr. Ellison, it really has been neat to work with you on the uh, school improvement community and uh, curriculum and special services, and uh, it can be a bit of a uh, ivory tower type and ask about well how students learn and how would you uh, how would you predict where kids would go and you know with your own kids or uh, what sparks their interest and what gets them to go on to certain careers and I've enjoyed some of those discussions and uh, it's really neat to pick your brain a little bit with all your years here at MPS and I, I wish you the, the best um, and Carl um, as I said at the Gerstacker Awards program you know, you, you've had probably some of the hardest years in education for six years as a superintendent. And uh, your passion for education, putting students first. I mean, the, uh, the speakers tonight were, was just amazing. Learn more about you just through the speakers and all the experiences that they've shared because I haven't been on the board that long really I, either myself. And so, um, but, uh, and, and actually both of you enjoy fishing and uh, you know, hopefully you have more free time. and. You get, and uh, Dr. Ellison can put another trout up on the wall, uh, mm -hmm. maybe another wall hanger there possibly. Uh, so uh, the best uh, to both of you. Um, with, the, uh, with the presentation tonight for Central Middle School, it does, uh, it does it is bittersweet with uh, uh, so many years of great traditions and history coming to a close. And it was really, really a sweet uh, send off for that school. Um, and I know Midland Daily News had a lot of great articles and uh, captured some of that history. And, I'm just hoping that that's going to continue uh, with uh, potential uh, for the building down the road, but also those students. I, I'm looking forward to a good transition and having uh, those students well taken care of. And I know a lot of that election of where those students can go and trying to um, elect uh, to, and allow a choice for those students has already taken place. And it's really nice that that much uh, proactive uh, management of that transition has already taken place. So it's very much appreciated. Um, so we'll go on to uh, next. Um. Well, a lot of people said a lot of nice things about you tonight, people who've known you longer and better than I have. You're going to tell the truth. And so, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that I know they all have to be true because they've known you longer and better. And a lot of people had some very eloquent things to say, but I think the, one, the comment that really caught my ear was when city manager Mr. John Lynch described or talked about you demonstrating leadership and making the people around you better. And I, I just thought about how you... Um, you know, you gave me so much good advice, and, and I think that making people around you better is really a great talent, but it doesn't happen by accident. I think you have to have the willingness, the real desire to want to do that, and I see that in you. And then a few minutes later when you talked about how you always look for the good in people and find it, I thought, aha, it all fits. I was right. <laughs> you, you do have that in you, and I really appreciate that. I really admire that in you, and I appreciate it a lot, and I thank you for all the encouragement you gave me and the advice that all turned out to be good. And I thank you also for your dedication to the Midland Public Schools. I know as a, 
as a community member and as a parent of two young women who were so fortunate to be able to be educated in the Midland Public Schools, I thank you for all of that. And the same goes to you, Dr. Olson. I thank you. I've enjoyed working with you and getting to know you, and I thank you for your dedication to your profession, to the Midland Public Schools. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, Lynn made your comments last week. I guess it's my turn. Um, first of all, on Central Middle School, it was great to see that presentation I just from a technology and young women and, and the spirit that came out of Central. But as we said when we did the elementary schools, a building's a building, it's brick and mortars. And they fall down and they get created. What really makes a building are memories and the people. And those people aren't going anywhere. They're still in the public schools. Some will be at Northeast, some will be at Jefferson. And I, I hope uh, and I'm confident just as our elementary uh, ships went, uh, people will fall in love with their new building just as fast as they fell in love with their old building. And uh, I hope uh, and I'm confident the Jefferson folks and the Northeast folks will welcome the Central students and parents into their system. And hopefully two years from now, they'll all look back and, and wonder what they were worried about. And that uh, I'm very confident going forward. Kathy, I don't know if I should be angry at you <laughs> or pleased with you because you got me started in this mess. <laughs> Uh, I started uh, my school involvement by talking about FOCUS uh, when a FOCUS program came out at a board meeting and uh, volunteered to be involved and it wasn't two days later I got a call from Kathy Allison to ask me to be on, on the school improvement committees. And that's where it all started with me in terms of besides my interest in education and kids with middle public schools. So thank you very much and we will miss you. You are, you are a leader, you are a known expert and uh, we will sorely miss that. So thank you for your service and thank you for getting me involved. Uh, lastly, my last reflection, I'm thinking back and it's May of 2007 and there were five pictures on that wall. And on Friday of May 18th at 6.58 p.m., and I can vouch for this very clearly, uh, I reached a verbal agreement with this guy on my left, far left, to be our next leader of Midland Public Schools and become the sixth picture on the wall. And it's daunting as a board president to lead a board through a superintendent search because while every board member feels the enormity of that task because that's the one key thing we do as, as Rick pointed out tonight. Uh, as president, you really feel that because you don't want it on your shift to not work out well. And when we looked at, the, at, at Carl and our other candidates, when we reviewed resumes, did interviews, talked to people in Charlotte, we could count on getting a superintendent with a positive focus, and we did, with the ability to adapt to a new environment and a culture in Midland, and you did. And with the financial acumen to get through the vagaries of state funding, which we never imagined they would be what they were, but you did. And with the educational expertise across a range of issues, from IBAB to athletics to special ed, to arts, and you did. But we knew we were gonna get that from our probing of you and the Charlotte community. What we couldn't know is how good that decision would be for Midland. And even with the moving of your family, with spouse employment, and teenage angst that comes with it, uh, you dove in immediately and you embraced Midland, and Midland embraced you, as you could see tonight. And yes, there were many issues we faced, and yes, there are bruised feelings. But rough seas can cause seasickness and bruised limbs as the boat bounces around the ship's occupants. And the real question is, did the ship and its occupants and its precious cargo arrive at the port safe and sound? Carl, as you heard tonight, I think that's assuredly a yes. It arrived safe and sound. We closed buildings, adults were impacted both in the number of jobs and in pay level. But the children, the precious cargo, uh, the reason we exist, are safe, sound, and doing very well, and arguably better than ever. So rest assured, your impact has been large and positive. And I, the one who led the effort to put that sixth picture on the wall, am very glad it's there. And it will be there another 95 years. So I'm glad to continue to be part of Midland. We both want you and need you. 
and thank you and congratulations. And on behalf of the board, we, I know you didn't want anything, so we, we minimized it. It can't get much smaller. <laughs> uh, but we are aware of one of Carl's favorite passions. And Carl, you and I had a brief discussion. I don't want to talk about it much more. It's fly fishing. This is from Little Forks. Okay. And uh, as my wife would say, it's the right size and the right color. Mm -hmm. And what I do know, <laughs> fishing for a fly fisherman, don't bother. <laughs> Give them something that they can go get that they really want. So from the rest of the board to you, thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. I appreciate it. Yeah. And with that, since I control the agenda meeting, Carl, it's as usual, back to you for your last comments. How about just before I do that, I ask, um, I think it's only appropriate where this is Kathy's last board meeting, at least at the K through 12 level and giving her, what, 21 years with the district, Kathy? Yeah, uh, close 20 years. I'd just like you to have an opportunity to respond to the board if you care to. <laughs> um, let's get some business out of the way first. How about we do this? A couple of really exciting announcements. I have two letters here in front of me. Uh, one is from the Roland M. Gerstacker Foundation saying, uh, Dear Mr. Ellinger, we are pleased to report that the trustees approved a grant in the amount of $360,000 at the May 10th, 2013 meeting in support of the International Baccalaureate Primary Years Program. They're going to pay that over the course of two different years, 2013 and 2014. And that it's their understanding that we may be back with a request for funding for a new TET type program in the spring of 2014. I've shared that with the board in email already. Uh, they would be happy to review the request for support of that program at that time. And it's a pleasure for them to support Midland Public Schools. So we're very excited and uh, graciously accept this gift from the Roland M. Ster uh, Gerstacker Foundation. And then the Charles J. Strostacker Foundation has written as well, saying we are pleased to advise you that our Board of Trustees has approved a grant of $120,000 designed for support of an international baccalaureate program to be introduced to elementary students and will receive that payment in December of this year. They'd like to extend their best wishes to MPS for continued success and they, they look forward to hearing about our accomplishments during the year. And they mention it's a pleasure to be among our current supporters. So thanks to those two foundations, um, that's the partial funding that we were looking for that allows us to move forward. We may have other community funders even yet come forward, but we can't announce those yet. So I'm very pleased to see that happen. And again, hats off to Dr. Ellison because she really led the effort of this district to move us down the IB path and with the great support that we got from the Dow Chemical Company and Mid-Michigan um, um, uh, Medical Center here in town as well. And then the very last thing before I make some personal comments, and I don't know how different they can be from what I, I mentioned earlier, is to put the focus back on students. Uh, because this is pretty incredible because for a middle school, this is a large amount of money, I think, from being a middle school principal for nine years. Our Jefferson students recently held a fundraising competition. This was obviously at the end of the year between first hour classes. This fundraiser was organized by the group Jefferson Stand students taking a new direction group and through this fundraiser they raised three thousand three hundred dollars that was donated to the american red cross for the oklahoma tornado relief fund that is fantastic to think that one middle school can raise over three thousand dollars for a cause like that i can think of no larger statement to make just about the um, charitable um, efforts of benefaction that this community does and to see it modeled by the very students that uh, many of their parents have done likewise, I think makes an incredible statement about this community. So I'm proud to have that association. And I'll tell you, it feels really, really good to say I've attended my last board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I haven't enjoyed them, although there have been times when you're looking at 150 people out there and it's not very much fun for any of us here. But I look back at the six years that I've been here and I look at the tremendous financial challenge that we have faced. And then in the midst of all that, trying to uh, still uphold that legacy and that tradition of academic excellence and excellence in the employees that you hire and you try to mentor and rely on all these other people to help do the same that 
care as much about the kids in the district and our staff and our community as I do. Um, and I look back and I say, you know what, what were those high points? What have we done to do that? You know, the building closure, sure, that helped out the budget. You know, we're looking at another one this fall. But there were a lot of successes and things that we did that I think had great impact. You know what, we are much further down the line in terms of implementing instructional technology and our backroom use of technology than before I got here. And I don't know that I deserve any more credit for that than anyone else except that someone, and I believe it is the role of the superintendent, needs to set the expectation that this, and, and the work that I would do with all of you and all of us would do with you and the study committees that we have, that's how that expectation gets set. And that takes some skills to facilitate the uh, success of that kind of a, an effort. Um, you know what? Um, I think we're the only third ISD in the state of Michigan that was able to successfully pass an enhancement millage. To us, those are big, big dollars. We're in our fourth year, I think, of collecting that. And for us, that's been anywhere between 3.1 and 3.3 million dollars every year. Imagine what our budget would look like if we didn't have that. Imagine what the budget here is going to look like if we don't have that in the future, which complicates when you come back and potentially ask for another technology bond or a sinking fund. Those are going to be challenges that are going to face you as a board, but you are up to that challenge, I think. Um, uh, those of you that are new are going to, it's like getting into the frying pan. Uh, but there's some veteran uh, boardsmanship that's developing here too that can help you guide you through that. I will miss that part of the job, that strategizing and taking on those large challenges. Um, I had no idea you had blindsided me with everything that was going on here tonight, and I feel very honored that you know those were community leaders that you heard from here. Th they are people that understand the business of the school business as well as just you know the responsibility we have for educating youth. There's a business behind the scenes that makes that happen. It means a lot to me to see that recognized. And Jerry, I suspect you had a lot to do with orchestrating that, so <laughs> I want to thank you for it. It's been my pleasure to be one of those six pictures that are out there. I don't know where you're going to put the seventh picture. You're going to have to rearrange them. Um, and so um, I leave here feeling good about the six years that I've had here. I feel fortunate to have landed in a community again that's as supportive of education as uh, the Midland community is. And I look forward to slowing the pace down tremendously and just enjoying this community as a citizen um, and then figuring out where I fit into that uh, in a more relaxed pace. So thank you for allowing me to serve you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. With that, we are adjourning. That was the longest short. That was the